Sometimes, God will hide great blessings inside your struggles. He will allow you to go through the valley of the shadow of death, so you can reach the table prepared for you in the presence of your enemies. Believe me, as I share this message with you, I know what it means to feel stuck, lost, and even alone. I know what it means to feel as if you're just going in circles, as if nothing seems to be working, as if no one understands what you're trying to say, and as if your prayers are not getting past the ceiling of your room. Yes, the Bible says that weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. But what if you've been waiting for your night to end and your morning to come for years now, and it seems like it may never happen? I don't have a direct personal answer for you, but I know where we can find a sure answer. The Word of God. The Bible tells us about the reliability of the promises and prophecies of God for us. It calls it a more sure word. Nothing is more guaranteed than the word promised from God. 2 Peter 1.19 we all have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Hence, if we are looking for answers, the best place to look is where you can find guaranteed answers, answers that live forever, the Word of God. What does the Bible say about how your struggles can lead to exponential blessings? Does it really say anything like that? Can you really find comfort in God's Word for your feelings right now? Yes, you can. One significant scripture that comes to mind when you feel like you're headed nowhere, stuck, confused, or just lost in this world, not being able to make sense of anything in your life, despite your trust in God, is Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Please allow me to show you something encouraging from these words in these few minutes. I want you to observe that you can genuinely love God, stand in His will, walk in His purpose for your life, and still face all things of life. Let that sink in for a moment. Sometimes God will protect and keep you from struggles because you love Him and are walking in His way and purpose for your life. However, it may not always happen this way. Like in the case of Joseph, Job, Abraham, Moses, and all the great men and women who walked with God. Sometimes God will allow you to face all things of this life in order to bring you into limitless blessings. You may be wondering, what do I mean by all things of life? It's the combination of all life's experiences. This means that it includes the good, the bad, and the ugly. The Bible doesn't say that good things work together for good to those who love God. It says all things work together for good. This means that although your struggles may not appear like the will of God for you, He knows how to turn them into a good testimony if you stand with Him. You need to realize that feeling stuck or lost is a part of your journey of faith. Am I for real? Oh, yes, I am. Look through the lives of the people who walked with God or experienced great miracles in their lives from Scripture or around you. One common thing with them is that they passed through certain points where they couldn't explicitly tell what was going on in their lives. If some of the people you admire for having great faith around you would honestly speak with you, it would surprise you that their journey started with so much confidence and vibrancy, but it came to a point where they just had to depend completely on God's promise instead of where they were or how they were feeling. Abraham did not always feel inspired or energetic throughout his journey. No, he didn't. At one point, he went back to God to question, I know you said you'd bless me, but I can't see a child or children to bear my name and fulfill my destiny of making me into a great nation. Genesis 15, 1-6 After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. 
And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Remember that from the beginning, Abraham had obeyed God and moved out of his homeland. Remember that his journey was dependent on the promise that God would bless him and make his name great. God didn't really tell him what he was going to do when he got there. God didn't even outright tell him where he was going. He just said, go to a land that I'll show you. Maybe like Father Abraham, you've also embarked on your journey of faith. Maybe like Abraham, you gave yourself over to Jesus and want to walk in the light of his truth. You boldly declare it because you believe it completely. But now almost everyone around you seems to be asking what's going on. Abraham's family may have even asked him that. And then he, like you and I, asked God too. But you can see that God understood him and gave him an answer to strengthen his faith. In your season of struggle, there are a few things to get straight. 1. You have a genuine and active relationship with God. Know that the Bible did not say everything will work for the good of everyone. No, it said for only those who love God. And the biblical definition of love of God is obedience to His commands. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, keep my commands. And 1 John 5, 1-3 confirms it. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. Hence, if you don't have a relationship of love and obedience with God, then you have to start with that. Ask Jesus to come into your heart right now and make you a new person. Surrender the lordship of your life over to him and commit yourself to live according to his instructions for your life, henceforth and forever. The guarantee of victory in this life and in the one to come is tied to this one truth, that you have a relationship with Christ. 2. You are in God's purpose for your life. This just confirms the first point. You can't be in God's plan when you don't have a relationship with Him. Then you can't claim to have a relationship with God and not want to walk in His purpose for you specifically. If you're not walking in God's purpose, then you have to ask God to help you as you repent and get back to what God wants you to do and where He wants you to be. As long as you're outside of God's agenda, there is no guarantee of safety or victory for you. If you're walking in God's purpose, then you can be sure to walk with your head held high. Regardless of the situation before you, there is a good end awaiting you. You see, each of us have been specifically called to fulfill a special assignment on earth. Your assignment in this world will have a great effect on the kind of experience you would go through in life. I've learned through study and personal experiences that many people suffer from the things that God intends to use them to accomplish. I remember listening to an older believer sharing his testimony once. He said that as a child, he and his family suffered so much poverty that he once ate a piece of washing soap because he was so hungry and there was nothing else to eat. Today, that man is a millionaire feeding families and communities. Children and families benefit from his generosity daily. He said that he believed God allowed him to go through what he went through as a child so that he would understand what suffering meant and the true value of riches. He said it further taught him that whatever wealth he would come into in life belongs to God and he was simply a steward. Beloved, what if I tell you that the journey and frustrations you're experiencing right now are preparing you for the exponential blessings tied to your destiny? Like God did to Abraham, I want to remind you of the promises and the things God has said to you that gave birth to your faith in Him. 
If you don't know which promises he's made, you can stand upon Romans 8 from earlier and build upon that. You see, the more you open yourself and your pains to God through prayer and worship, the more you can give God the room to strengthen you to reach the finish line. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Do not lose hope. Don't lose your confidence. Hold fast to what you believe. God will never fail you. Surround yourself with all the encouragement you need. Stay away from the things that discourage you or suggest alternatives to God's blessings. As you do this, beyond your feelings, your faith will grow more and more, and you can stand unshakable in the middle of the storm and say, I know my Redeemer lives. God is on your side, my friend. Stand your ground and don't let go of the promise you've received from Him. Your morning is coming, and your joy will come with it. Now, trust and stand. Will life always go the way you want? Will things always happen the way you wish for them to happen? When they don't go as planned, how do you react? How do your emotions define how your faith stands? Dear believer, when God made you, He made you whole, a spirit being with a heart, a mind, and a body. You have the ability to feel, think, and respond to the things happening around you. This ability is what makes you a living being. This means that you possess all the characteristics of life necessary for living. When you're in pain, happy, sad, excited, hungry, afraid, or anxious, there are certain feelings and expressions that accompany these. It's your body's way of telling you it's aware of these things. Our feelings are our soul's way of telling us that it recognizes that it's affected by what's going on. It's our soul's way of identifying with something or someone. This can both be a blessing and a problem for the child of God. When you become more spiritually aware, you'll learn that Satan has a way of entering everything God has created in us and using them against us. For example, Think about bodily cravings, like hunger for food, thirst, and even our sex drive. All of these are a part of God's creation. They're natural and a great blessing. You need to eat or your body will deteriorate and die. You need water or you'll die of dehydration. Sexual urges and sex itself are blessed experiences that should bind a legally married couple together in holy union for life. It was created by God as a means for each partner to express their passion and enjoy each other's company as they grow in their bond. However, you know how the enemy can take each of these things and corrupt them. A person who lets their hunger drive them could become a glutton or even steal. Some people would eat just about anything when their craving comes, without any regard for their health or how their food choices now will affect them tomorrow. Then fast forward a few years later and some of them are starting to suffer for allowing their cravings to direct their actions. We're also aware of how the enemy has built an entire industry around sex to bind more and more people to a life of unrestrained craving for sex without regard for how it affects them or those around them. This has resulted in many broken homes and dysfunctional families. Like I said earlier, the enemy did not create anything. All he does is take what God's already created and corrupts it in order to destroy you. The Bible calls him the thief because he steals. He takes what God made and turns it into something corrupt for his own evil desires. And what is his end? To steal, kill, and destroy. My message to you today is simple. As much as God created you whole and made you a being with feelings and emotions, you are not called to be led or controlled by your emotions, but by faith. The Bible repeats it at least four times for us to live by faith. Habakkuk 2.4 Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Romans 1.17 For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. 
Galatians 3.11 But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. In Hebrews 10.38 Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. The rest of the Bible demonstrates this in many ways. A call to walk with God is a call to walk by faith and not by emotions or mental prowess. Paul, the apostle, sums it up in 2 Corinthians 5-7. For we live by faith, not by sight. Sight here refers to emotions or our natural senses. Beloved, if you want to walk with God successfully and have the experience of the supernatural in your life, you must realize that your emotions will not do you any good nor bring anything to you. Emotions are unstable. They're situation dependent. Observe anyone driven by their emotions. They're unstable. They're up today and down tomorrow. Science may call it whatever name they want, but it doesn't change the fact that it's the work of emotions and it's a limitation in your faith. Faith is the core of the Christian life. It's the air we breathe, the foundation of our salvation. Ephesians 2.8 for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. You do not become born again because you're sorry for the things you've done in the past. You become born again when you place your faith in the finished work of Jesus on Calvary, declaring through the same faith that Jesus is Lord. When Paul and Silas were miraculously saved from prison one night, the jailer met them and asked how he could be saved too. Hear what they said. Acts 16, 29 to 31. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Faith in God is believing and receiving what God has said or is giving his truth and claiming it to be real for you. If you want to follow your emotions, you might begin to doubt your salvation. Do you know why? Because you're not going to wake up every day feeling like a Christian. In fact, on the contrary, you might wake up some days feeling like just the worst person on earth. However, faith is standing on the conviction that you believe in Jesus and you stand on what His Word says about your salvation. The enemy will fight you using your emotions. In fact, this is one of the fiercest battlefronts in Christian warfare with the flesh. The fight of the flesh is more of a fight of faith than a fight for control. There are many unsafe people who have mastered control over their flesh through different routines and disciplines. However, what makes believers more privileged than them is the fact that the believers have faith in Christ. And so they have Christ. This is the hope of the believers and their greatest confidence. The Apostle Paul writes that the believer's hope of glory is Christ in them. Now, when the enemy fights you with feelings, feelings of guilt for your past or afflictions, feelings of fear, anxiety, and other emotional attacks, you must remember to respond with faith. Remind him that you're a being of faith, born of faith and sustained by faith. For instance, you're not called a saint because you attain perfection, but because through the finished work of redemption from Jesus Christ and your faith in Him, God has set you in the company of saints who have been perfected. Hebrews 12, 22-24 But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Therefore, in the face of the enemy, you can remind him that God's eternal word has declared who you are and where you belong, among the saints. And so, no matter how you feel, God's Word takes first place. Sometimes, you want to express the way you feel, 
angry, frustrated, discouraged, disappointed, or hurt. However, you must remind yourself, no, I'm a child of God, a person of faith. I won't respond according to how I feel right now. I'm not going to allow the enemy to use my emotions as a weapon against me. Rather, I'll find out what God's Word says about the situation that's causing this feeling and stand on it. When you begin to think and talk like this, the Bible says you are submitting to God. The only person who can rebuke the enemy and have him flee is the one who submits to God. James 4.7 Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. How do you submit to God? You submit by taking God's word as what it is, the truth. You submit by making God's word your standard, your reality, your truth, and the most important factor in your life. God does not deny that your emotions are real. The Bible says that we have a high priest in Jesus who understands how we feel and that he was tempted, hard pressed on every side just like you and me, all without sinning. It teaches us that through Jesus, we have an example to follow, and we see a possibility of living a life of faith and not one led by emotions. When fearful emotions attack you, although from the natural standpoint it's okay to be afraid, you must remember that the enemy will use that against you. So what should you do? Shut out the noise and cause of that outburst or feeling. Get yourself in your secret place, the presence of God, and soak up what God says about the situation. When you do this, you'll find that the fear begins to diminish, and in its place, a fresh confidence arises. This is not limited to feelings of fear, but everything else. Anger, failure, anxiety, worry, and even sickness. This truth should become your weapon in the war front of emotional attacks. When you let your faith lead you, instead of crying over a relationship that's not working, instead of thinking of avenging a hurt, instead of thinking how happy you would be if you had a million dollars, or instead of accepting hopelessness because of the news of a pandemic, you go to your knees, find out what God's Word has said, and pray to Him with it. Prayer has a way of dealing with your emotions very effectively. It helps you pour it all out before God and have it replaced with confidence in God's intervention. So with faith, you come out loving and smiling with the person your emotion wanted you to punch a few minutes ago. With faith, you'll come out encouraging others. When earlier, they'd heard you complaining over how bad the economy was. Your emotions will never strengthen you or cause you to receive anything from God. Rather, they may shut you out. But faith is the key to receiving from God. Believe what God has said, my friend. You are a being of faith. Let it lead you. Let it put your emotions in order and use it to channel God's compassion on the world. Don't let the enemy use it to further corrupt the world or you. I declare over you through faith that you've got this. Everything's going to be great. In this fight with God on your side, you will end up well. You need to start trusting God to turn things around in your life, or else you might find yourself in a never-ending cycle looking for solutions. Some people would rather trust in themselves or in other people than in God. Over the years, we've developed a strong confidence in ourselves that has pushed us further and further away from faith in God. Technology and scientific discoveries have played a large role in making this happen. These things are good, and knowledge in itself has saved many people. However, the purpose of knowledge and advancement in technology was not to push us away from God or for us to doubt His credibility or existence. We are supposed to observe human advancement through the various ages as a manifestation of God's sovereignty revealed through these unfolding mysteries. Things we never believe existed in nature have been discovered. Cures for diseases we never knew of have been discovered. New places in space, new species of animals and plants, and newer inventions have been discovered. 
All of them were meant to point us in the direction of the Sovereign Creator who placed them there to be uncovered by us, and not for us to think of ourselves as our own God. David looked at the night sky as he must have done countless times in the sheep fields and said in Psalms 8, 1-3, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth! You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies, to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. Then he adds interestingly in the next verse, Psalm 8, 4 to 8. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? human beings that you care for them. You've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. If you behold the wondrous beauty of the night sky on a dark night, you will understand and feel the smallness that David alluded to in those verses. We are so infinitesimal compared to the vastness of God's creation. How can he even be bothered to know about or care for a mere human being? The majesty and wonder of God is that as great as he is, he does care about us. His majesty is in the greatness of creation, on earth and extending to the farthest heavens and yet He wants to know us and include us in His plan. The glory of God's infinite creation is seen in His particular care for lowly man. How do you think God feels after doing all He does for us, only to find that we trust His creation more than Him? Our God is vast, great, and the Almighty. All things, both the unknown and the known, are beneath Him. And in His greatness, He wants you and I to come under the shadow of His sovereignty and experience the splendor of His glory. We may complain as much as we want about how God doesn't show up when we want Him to, or question, if He truly exists, why bad things happen. Yet if we do not start trusting God to turn things around in our lives, we'll keep struggling to no avail. I recently listened to a very interesting story on social media. A Christian man was at a barber shop. The barber kept ranting about how there was no God and questioning if he did exist, why was there suffering? The Christian man didn't answer. He just kept quiet until the barber was done. He paid for his haircut and as he was stepping out of the barber shop, he saw a homeless man who appeared very hairy and unkempt walking by. The barber noticed the man too. Then the Christian man said out loud, Barbers do not exist. The barber was shocked to hear that. The Christian man repeated it again. This time, he said it louder. The barber quickly replied, That's not true, I'm here. To this, the Christian man replied, If barbers exist, why are there people like this hairy man? The barber said, That's what happens when they don't come to me or another barber. The Christian man then said, That's your answer. You can't blame God for things that happen to people when they don't come to or trust Him. Most of the wars, famine, and pain in the world exist because many people have not come to God to save them. Because many are not touched by God's salvation, their lives may affect others, who in turn become victims of wickedness. Many people have been broken and experienced failures, afflictions, and destruction, not because God wasn't there but because they didn't seek the Lord for help. God wants you to start trusting Him. I already shared with you why you should trust Him. He's sovereign. He's almighty. He has all it takes to turn things around in your life. He has the strength and power to do it, and nothing is impossible for Him. He created all things, and they're under His sovereignty. Another reason you should trust God is that He's willing to turn things around in your life. Once upon a time, a blind man met Jesus and said, Lord, if you will, please make me whole. Let me receive my sight. To this, Jesus replied, I am willing. Receive your sight. 
The Bible tells us that God anointed Jesus to go about doing good and healing all oppressed by the devil. God would not be healing people if he wasn't able to do so, or if he didn't want to heal anyone. But he's both able and willing to do much more than what we ask. Ephesians 3.20 Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. When you need someone to help you solve a problem, you want someone who's both able and willing to do what you need. Someone may be able, but if they're unwilling, you won't get anything from them. Perhaps they may be willing, but they lack the ability to do anything for you. There's nothing you can do about that either. But glory to God, He has the ability and He's willing to help all who trust and come to Him. Hebrews 7.25 Therefore, he's able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. One more reason why you should start trusting God to turn things around in your life is because it's a greater risk to trust man or yourself than it is to trust God. Yes, it takes courage to trust God, especially when all odds are stacked against you. However, it is an even greater risk to put your confidence in man. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 5-8, This is what the Lord says, Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. What benefit awaits you in the Lord when you start trusting Him? If only we could dare to trust the Lord and put our confidence in Him. Trust not in our earthly connections or material possessions, but in the power and sovereignty of our God. Maybe you want to give God a chance to reveal Himself to you, but don't know how. And you're asking, how do I start trusting God? To do this, the first thing is to believe that God can and is willing to turn things around for you. As I've shared, you know by now that more than anything, He wants you to do just that. Trusting God means that you believe He can handle whatever you give Him better than anyone else. Trusting God means you step aside and let God take over your fight. Secondly, commit the situation into His hands. How do you do this? Through prayer. Prayer turns things around. Prayer changes things and changes you. Through prayer, you're telling God that you're helpless without Him. Through prayer, you're declaring your dependence on Him. When you cast your needs on God through prayer, you're declaring that you trust Him to turn things around. Thirdly, have patient faith. Most people don't have a problem believing or praying. They're just not good at waiting in faith. They want things to change now. However, with God, you must know how to trust Him to turn things around in His own time and not in your time. The Bible says that you're to emulate and follow the examples of those who inherited the promises of God through faith and patience. Faith claims the blessings and testimonies, and patience waits for them to come into fruition. Here's where you need to trust the Holy Spirit to strengthen you, because the enemy will put you under pressure. Your faith will come under attack. But if you hang on long enough, you will overcome and experience a change of story. This is how you trust God, my friend. If you do this, you can be sure that things will turn around for you, and you will never remain the same. In a world filled with many voices and many spirits who want to commune with you, you have to listen when God's Spirit speaks to your heart. One of your greatest assets as a Christian is the Holy Spirit. He's the means through whom God the Father communicates with you in your spirit either directly through the Word or through other means. 
Sometimes the Lord may be speaking to you, but because you don't understand or know how to listen, you may think He's silent. The Bible says there are many kinds of languages in this world, and each one has meaning. Not one is useless. It's also necessary to say that even in our relationship with God, every word from God has a meaning, an instruction, a promise, and an intention from God to us. If we miss the meaning or main message when God speaks to our hearts, we miss everything He aims to work in our lives. I say this to all believers. One of the main reasons we wander and struggle is because we hardly let God lead us. And one of the most common ways God leads us, His children, is by speaking directly to our hearts. How does God do this? He speaks to our spirits through His own Spirit living within us. You see, if you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit lives inside you. God does not need to come down to communicate with you. He now lives inside you through His Spirit. Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit with His disciples in John 16, 12 to 15. I have much to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify Me, because it is from Me that He will receive what He will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what He will make known to you. Through the Holy Spirit, the Lord brings light into what the Bible says. Through the Holy Spirit, the Lord will give you instruction regarding your decisions and how you ought to go about them. Let me walk you through this a little to be sure you know how the Lord will convey His words to you. You see, like I said earlier, God speaks to His children through many ways. God can use different means to communicate with you than He does with another person. Some people may testify how God speaks to them through dreams or visions. Another person may say He speaks to them through an audible voice, as if someone's with them in the same room. Another may come and say they just sense a witness within their spirits over something. They can tell that it's God speaking to them about something. Whichever way God uses, one thing is clear. Regardless of how God speaks to each one of us, we must know how to identify and pay attention when He speaks. And one of the identifying marks of a believer who's intimate with God is your ability to know when He speaks to you by spirit. Jesus said in John 10, 27, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. When you're close to someone, you can easily identify their voice no matter where you are. I remember the first time I was meeting a close friend of mine whom I'd met online. We'd known each other for years and shared great moments. However, we'd never met each other face to face, except through video calls and photographs. Yet it felt like we'd known each other for ages. That day, I arrived in the city late at night because of traffic jams and he had to come pick me up from my cab stop. When I saw him coming from a distance in the darkness, I could tell he was the one, even though I hadn't seen his face in the light yet. All I could see was the silhouette of his image, and that was enough. That is the true power of intimacy. If you're close to someone, you can recognize their voice and presence, even if you can't see them. Do you know that you can get that intimate with God? In fact, do you know that God wants you to be that intimate with Him? He wants you to know His presence and identify His voice. He wants you to know how to differentiate between the voices of the world, the voice of the devil, and the voice of His Spirit in your heart. You may not know this, but the devil also tries to speak to your heart just like God does. And this is exactly why you must listen and know to obey God when God's Spirit is speaking to your heart. If you can't, you'll fall into many troubles. Jesus said in John 10, 3-5, The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger, 
In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. In these verses, Jesus was confirming that there will be voices of strangers who try to communicate with you. But if you're his follower, you won't pay attention to those voices, but rather run away from them. When God's Spirit speaks to you, He communicates with your heart. He doesn't speak to your physical ears. I believe that one reason most believers struggle to hear God is because we want to hear Him with our physical ears. And that's not how God communicates. You see, the Bible says that God is a spirit and must be worshipped as one. As a spirit, He communicates with His children through their own spirits. When the Spirit of God is communicating with you, he uses the voice of your consciousness. Sometimes this may sound like you're the one thinking to yourself, but the truth is that God's Spirit is speaking to your heart. Now, the devil can do this too, but there are ways to tell if it's God's Spirit speaking to your heart or the devil. Number 1. When God's Spirit speaks to your heart, His words don't contradict what the Bible says. This is the first and most important measure of God's Word. Remember that when the devil tempted Jesus, he quoted verses from the scriptures. How did Jesus recognize and counter the deception? He revealed that Satan was taking those verses out of context. You see, not every word taken from the Bible and echoing in your heart is from God's Spirit. You need to be able to connect the words being said with the character and power of God. The enemy or your flesh will not give your heart inspirations that agree with the character of God. For example, when you hear a voice telling you to avenge yourself of a hurt, that's not from God's Spirit. Why? Because it doesn't agree with the character of God from the Bible that says, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. The voice that tells you not to apologize when you're at fault is not from God's Spirit either, even if it backs you up with verses from the Bible. Why? Because it doesn't align with the character of the Holy Spirit, which is love, sacrifice, and humility. This is why you need to get close to your Bible. The more you understand God's Word, the more you'll know about His character, as the Bible tells us a lot about God and how He operates. Develop your Bible reading and prayer habit. The success of your journey with God depends on it. Number 2. When God's Spirit speaks to your heart, His words come with peace and not anxiety. Another very important way to know God's voice is whenever He speaks to your heart, you'll sense His peace as well. God's Word doesn't lead you to confusion or panic. Instead, like a gentle wind, it blows away anxiety and gives you clarity and comfort, no matter the situation involved. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 85, 8, I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to His people, His faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. What God may be instructing you to do may seem difficult or even impossible to the human mind. Yet in your heart, you'll have an assurance of peace. The Bible calls it a peace that passes all understanding. So, how do you listen to God's Spirit when He speaks to your heart? 1. Silence the outside noise. The world is full of many voices, so in order for you to create an atmosphere around yourself where you can easily listen to God's voice, you need to learn to shut out the noise. How do you do this? Give attention to the things that add more value to your spiritual life, instead of paying attention to the carnal things. The more you feed your spirit, the stronger it gets. And the stronger your spiritual sensitivity becomes, the more your heart can hear God without confusion or mix-ups with other voices. You can also silence the noise by speaking the Word of God out loud over yourself habitually. Make it a habit to always speak God's Word and promises over yourself. You're more likely to hear God speak to your heart through the words you've been speaking over yourself, just like the devil uses the negativity in your mind to speak to you too. 2. Spend time in prayer, especially time praying in tongues. The more time you spend praying in tongues, the more you subdue your mind. When you pray in tongues, your mind isn't participating, but your spirit is. 
At that time, God can speak to you, and you'll hear. This is one of the reasons the devil is constantly trying to influence your prayer life negatively. Prayer is not just dashing in and dashing out. It's communicating with God, talking to and listening to God speak. During prayer, you can become silent in meditation, especially when you're fasting. Most times, we underestimate the power of fasting. We think we should only fast when we have a big problem or need power. But the truth is that fasting is meant to help you hear what God's saying and give your spirit more strength over the flesh. If you're going to succeed in your Christian journey and in life as a whole, dear saint, then you need to take these words to heart. You have to start listening so that when God's spirit speaks to your heart, you'll hear and you'll obey. Let God fight your battles because he always wins. There is no better champion to represent you than the one who has never lost a contest. Listen, your struggles and your battles are valid. They are real. And God knows that they are too much for you. Many times we feel God is not aware of our struggles or wants to have nothing to do with us. The truth is that he does. But we do not always give him the chance to take over those battles. If you are listening to my voice right now, I encourage you to hand over that struggle in your life to the Lord. Let him fight your battles for you, and you will find rest in his work. You can't win that struggle by yourself. You need God's help. Otherwise, you'll end up losing the battle again and again. Here is a story of a man named Lawrence Mendoza and how God fought his battle at a challenging season in his life. Because of the power of fervent prayer, he was able to escape a life sentence at a maximum security prison. This happened when he allowed God to take charge of his life after so many years of resisting his will. Lawrence Mendoza was born in the Bronx section of New York City, raised in a single parent home, and was the younger of two brothers. He became well acquainted with emotional pain at the age of five when his father died in a car accident, and he had to live in fear of losing his mother too. Lawrence and his brother were sent to a Catholic school for the majority of their elementary years. Their mother took them to church every Sunday, and Lawrence eventually joined the church and became an altar boy for several years. He would feel peace whenever he was serving as an altar boy in the church. This was always an escape from all the chaos around him. As Lawrence grew through life, he came face to face with various sweet and sour experiences. His life seemed to go well for a while, but then began to spiral down into worse and worse situations. After experiencing a series of bad relationships and dropping out of college, he started dealing with depression. He soon lost his purpose in life. All his self-esteem was lost. He considered himself a nobody and a failure headed for a crossroad, not knowing which direction to choose. At age 24, Lawrence began to smoke marijuana. Within a few days, he had gone deeper, doing harder drugs, specifically cocaine, heroin, dust, PCP, pills and liquor. He did not like the life that he was leading. He also felt like the world had broken its promise to him to love him. You see, he had grown up with the idea that the world loved him and that he would succeed on the strength of that love. He was struggling to find peace because he started seeking his love where there was none to find. Only God can give you unconditional love and peace, child of God. No one else can. One day, Lawrence decided to end his life because he felt miserable. He was stuck in a drug haze when he came to the Spiten Dival Bridge, which connects the Bronx and Manhattan. He climbed to the top. As he straddled the beams, which was about 300 feet above the train tracks in the Hudson River below, he told God that he was tired and was ready to come home. Within minutes, he was surrounded by helicopters, firemen, police, and a camera crew. As he was about to jump, a rescue crew member said, Hey, God loves you, he quoted the 23rd Psalm. Shortly after that, Lawrence heard his mother screaming up at him, I love you, son. Please don't jump. That stopped him, and he got down. Lawrence was taken to the psychiatric hospital for a checkup, but he was able to talk his way out of being detained there. 
Although he was rescued that first time, his drug use and suicidal behavior continued for a few more weeks. Depression, mental and emotional torment, and his self-destructive rebellious ways were taking him on a one-way, no-return ticket to hell. One day, he overdosed on drugs purposely to end his life, only to be revived through using a respirator and having his stomach pumped. That same year, he jumped off a seventh-story building while on a drug binge, only to have his belt buckle catch on part of a fire escape, preventing his death and allowing him to be pulled to safety. This episode took him back for another trip to the hospital, and he was treated with electric shock and medicine. It almost seemed like God was standing in his way each time, rescuing him from himself. But he just couldn't break free, nor did he know how to let God in. Even after experiencing God's saving power in which he turned from his sins and accepted Christ, he only managed to stay clean for six months. He didn't utilize the proper weapons to fight against the enemy's devices. He refused to use God's weapons to fight his spiritual battles and he became entangled again. Without a prayer life, Christian fellowship or the word of God as crucial parts of his life, his struggles continued as if they never left. Remember that the Bible already told us that we are at war in this world and our victory lies in the effective use of the weapons that God has given us as long as we are on the earth. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For your struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. In his struggle with these things, Lawrence entered three consecutive prison terms. At first, he was sent to minimum security prisons, where he violated his parole conditions each time and was sent back to finish his sentence. He would later be convicted for vehicle theft and seven other felonies, and as a persistent offender, he was facing a minimum 15 years to life in prison. When he tried to escape from the maximum security prison, an additional seven years was added to his sentence. Finally, in a cell for high-profile cases, Lawrence knelt and cried out to the Lord in prayer. He prayed like he never prayed before and asked Jesus Christ to take control of his life once again. He asked the Lord to take control of his present situation. He was committing his battles and struggles into God's hands, and he prayed for strength to go on despite the life sentence he was facing. He asked God to forgive him for all his sins and for trying to live life on his own. About 10 months after that moment, Lawrence experienced God's intervention. He was delivered by God from a life sentence and released. He began regularly attending a Bible study with other believers at church, studying God's Word daily for hours, and growing stronger in a spiritual relationship with the Lord through prayer. He went on to complete his Associate of Religious Education degree, which God used to manifest His Word in his life. At the time of sharing his testimony, Lawrence could boldly say these words, now that I strive daily to allow Jesus Christ full control of my life, I just rest in His peace. I have the Holy Spirit's power now, and I don't lean on my own. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have stepped over the obstacle of fear, of doubt, and of low self-esteem. 
I know that I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I know now through God's word that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I now strive to live by faith in God's word, uplifted by prayer, and seek to labor with Holy Spirit power and direction. My heart's desire is to constantly be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and not my own. The state issued me my temporary green clothing with the number 99A-4250 written on them. Today I walk with the new clothes of Christ, which are eternal clothes, to fight the spiritual battle. By faith, I wear the holy robes of righteousness given to me when I turned all my life over to Jesus Christ. What an amazing testimony! Doesn't this show you that no matter how far you have gone, God can save you if you let Him take over the fight? Anyone genuine will tell you that they understand the testimony of this dear brother because we are all products of God's deliverance. At one point in our lives, we also faced our own struggles, but when we handed over the reins to Christ, we found rest. The secret is this. Things may not change overnight, but that is not the main issue here. It is no longer your fight, no longer your business or worry. Now you rest in his peace with faith that your past is gone and you have a new and better life in Christ. As long as you couldn't find rest from struggling, you were kept a slave. But the moment Christ takes over, you rest in his rest, trusting in his strength. Let the story of Lawrence inspire you to commit yourself to building your spiritual armory with God's weapons, prayer, studying the word, fellowshipping with other saints, and learning to walk in obedience to the Holy Spirit. It's time for you to walk free. Not tomorrow. Do it now. Call on the Lord today and ask Him to come take control of your battle. He never loses. N.T. Wright once said, True worship is open to God, adoring God, waiting for God, trusting God even in the dark. Have you ever had to wait for something to come that seemed like it would never come? Waiting is one of the hardest things to do, especially waiting for God to do what He promised to do. However, without mixing words, I will say this. Waiting on God or waiting for Him is the one thing that separates those who get His best and those who get the crumbs left behind. You may settle for the crumbs, but you would miss the adventure of the main course from which they fell. Our Christian journey is a journey of faith. You can't tell what lies ahead except by holding on to God's word on the subject. The world cannot understand how intelligent people can believe in heaven, hell, an invisible God, holiness, and a life greater than sin and death. Why? Because they feel these are abstract ideas, fictions, and fragments of the imagination. No wonder the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. However, we know what we believe, not because our natural minds understand or our eyes have seen it physically, but because our hearts bear the witness of the Spirit, and we are convinced that God exists and every word he says is true. This life of faith gives credence to your faith, dear saint. A believer without faith invalidates their belief in the first place. No wonder the Bible says that the just, that is, you and every person who believes and has accepted Christ, walking in Him, shall live by faith. If you turn that the other way around, it would be, the just would die without faith. Faith is taking God at His word and standing by for Him to do what He said He would do. In a world filled with many do-it-yourself mindsets, there are things you cannot do by yourself. If we could, the world would not be plunging into the darkness as it is today. However, 
When you do not know and cannot explain what is going on in your life, you can trust that you have a Heavenly Father who is working in the background to ensure that you come out triumphant in the circumstances around you. This is why I included the quote by N.T. Wright at the beginning of this video. The Bible tells us what our greatest and truest act of worship is. It is not in a song, in a dance, or in what we say, but in our openness and submission to the wisdom and promise of God. It is the submission of our strength, intelligence, and abilities to wait on God's command either to move or to stand still. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 through 2 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Someone may say, but I thought this verse was talking about holiness. Yes, you're right, but it was talking about something more as well. You see, the offering of your body as a living sacrifice is beyond just carrying out good works, but of giving yourself in your entirety by faith, trusting that every sacrifice involved in that decision would be duly rewarded by God. For example, it would entail you to obey certain instructions regarding certain areas of your life when everyone else around you is taking a different path. Thus, the next verse would say, do not be conformed to this world. Why? Because every day the world wants you to conform. You tell yourself things like, gone are the days when people wait around for God to come do what he said he would do. Now we have his power to go and do it ourselves. After all, heaven helps those who helps themselves. Trust me when I tell you, my friend, if you can help yourself, then you do not need heaven's help. Heaven does not help those who can help themselves because they would take the glory of the results for themselves and think they did it. Whatever God does, he likes to leave his signature on that all the glory may be to him. Why does he do this? Because he does not like to share his glory with anybody. Isaiah chapter 42 verse 8 says, I am the Lord, this is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. Is there something in your life that you've entrusted to God and it seems to be taking forever? Don't worry about how long it's taking. God doesn't want you counting the days or the ticking clock. Rather, he wants you to wait on him. Elizabeth Elliot once said, Waiting on God requires the willingness to bear uncertainty, to carry within oneself the unanswered question, lifting the heart to God about it whenever it intrudes upon one's thoughts. This is faith. It is what you must defend with all your heart against conformity to the world. It is your true act of worship. It will affect how you live, where you go, the decisions you make, the things you say yes or no to. Hence, this is why I said the submission of your all in faith is your true act of worship. Sometimes God can feel near, and other times he may seem far. You must drink so much of his living water when you have the opportunity, so that when he seems far, you can still connect your heart to him and refresh your parched soul. Yes, our souls can get parched when we travel down the dark alleys of life, when you don't know how long you have to keep struggling to pay the bills or school fees, when you don't know the next time a miracle will happen in your life, when you don't know the next time you would get another contract. All of these can represent dark and trying times, and during these times, Satan can attack you with the pressure over the unanswered questions and uncertainty about the future. You don't have to fear not having answers to why it's taking so long or why the better days haven't arrived. No, you don't. God didn't ask you to have an answer to why your baby hasn't come, why you haven't been called for the interview, or why your loved one died. However, there is something he wants you to know. 
that he lives. Job said in the book of Job, chapter 19, verses 25 through 27, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Look at the confidence of a man who seemingly did not have the Holy Spirit living inside him. At a point in life when he could not tell if he would ever see better days or if he would die with his troubles, he uttered these timeless words, I know my Redeemer lives. Child of God, while growing up, we were taught a song that said, Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds my future. My life is worth a living just because he lives. These words over the years have kept many believers above high water and into their testimonies. You need to wait, my friend. Before you throw in the towel, wait. Before you give up on ever having better days again, wait. Before you quit on that man, woman, or child of yours, wait. God is working in the background. Pray about your needs. Sing about them. Meditate on his promises. Do everything you can, but don't ever accept Satan's lies that God has forsaken you or that he is doing nothing. Listen, for everything happening to you, God is working behind the scenes. That's why the Bible says that he is able to do exceedingly more than you could ever ask or even imagine. No one sees the movie director. However, he directs scripts and determines the outcome of the movie. Your life is like a successful script that God has put together. Sometimes your life will look like it is going nowhere. Sometimes it will feel like you are stranded and God is silent. At that time, some people may sadly even conclude that you are the cause of your predicament. Let them. Some may even say God has abandoned you because you are walking in disobedience. They may try to convince you that it's because of a sin that your life is that way. But if you know that your Redeemer lives, and if you are convinced that your walk with God is an honest one, rooted in faith, you owe no one an explanation. The only thing worth knowing is that your Redeemer lives. God has got you covered. You may not see him, but he is there with you. David said that his confidence as he walked through the valley of the shadow of death was not his strength or the fact that he could see God, but simply because he knew that God was his shepherd. He was convinced that even though he couldn't see him, he was there with him through that valley. Moses told the Israelites before the Red Sea as the Egyptians marched on behind them, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You may not hear God approaching, you may not feel him, but trust that he is with you. He made a promise in Psalms. Don't worry about the how, just trust him. Stand on his promise. Don't conform to the ways of the world around you unless you are convinced that God has said, go, don't go. Stand only when he says to stand and step out only when he says to step out. Any action carried out in haste and outside of God's instruction will likely result in regret. Don't come to a point where you wish you had waited on him. Is it worth waiting on God, the right man or woman? For you will come. It is worth waiting. You will go to school again. You will become the one who will lift your family out of their struggles. You will one day hold your baby in your hands. You don't serve a dead or wicked God. You serve a living God. He is alive and he is your redeemer. Don't fret. Don't jump out of the boat. When the time is right, you will know. At that time, everything will fall into place. Why? Because it is your time. 
If only God could open your eyes to see his plans for your life. You would wake up every day feeling on top of the world. I once told someone that if David lived today, no one would probably call him a man after God's heart. He would probably never believe that there was anything good in this man who killed the man to marry his wife. This man who made many mistakes for which the nation suffered. However, David never gave up on himself but kept seeking God and his plan for his life until he matured into it. If you think you've seen the best of yourself or the best in this life, then you have no idea what God has in mind. The reason many of us are very quick to give up on ourselves is because we do not know that God has a plan for our lives. Therefore, we define ourselves by failures, mistakes, and experiences. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love Him. Can you ponder on this for a moment? It says what God has prepared for you, no eye has seen, no human mind has conceived, and no ear has heard. I feel like we do not hear as much about the subject as we should. If we did, we would not have believers, especially among the younger folks, giving up on themselves or contemplating taking their own lives or the lives of others. It is true that there is nothing new under the sun. You may have heard that before. However, you must realize that even if there is nothing new as per life situations and experiences, nobody's destiny is the same as another's. Our gifts, strengths, callings, and glories differ. So, you may be looking at the content of the termination letter in your hand and feeling like you are hopeless. You may be looking at that bad review and feeling you're not good enough. But God is letting you come across this video because He wants you to know that He's got great plans for your life. These things may be setbacks, but you are going to bounce back from them and into your destiny. You need to know that we are living in a world ruled by the devil. The Bible calls Satan the God of this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The world system, entertainment, fashion, media, and so on, are under the control of the devil. It is not designed to favor you. Let me say that again. As a child of God, the world is not run to favor you or help you. On the contrary, everything the world offers you serves to achieve its purpose by two means. One, to water down your spirituality and faith until you embrace neutrality. Or number two, to frustrate you by contention until you fall out of the faith. It is one of the root causes of the challenges of life many believers face. Satan wants you to come to this point where you see no good in yourself, especially as a Christian. I have considered the testimonies of some criminals in history from good backgrounds and found something they had in common. Each of them came to a point in their lives where they didn't think they fit into society as a responsible person any longer, and so they only found themselves useful in crime. I have even heard some who said they found fulfillment in it. This may sound absurd to you. Do you know why? Because you haven't embraced the enemy's lies and your eyes are still open. If you let him fill your mind up, soon you may embrace his lies as well. When I consider these testimonies, one thing I ask is, how is it that you could believe that you were better off a nuisance in society than a responsible individual? If you were truly good for nothing, then you wouldn't even be good enough for the crime or wayward lifestyle you gave into. If you were truly hopeless, then you would not fit in anywhere. I want you to think about it too. Doesn't it all make sense now? If I had the skill to drop out of school to sell drugs, for example, because I think it's an easier or quicker way to become wealthy, I am lying to myself. At the end of the day, I am going to look back and find that even this lifestyle requires a great amount of skill to succeed. When you look at it, 
You will now know why most people who take certain paths do not tolerate their children walking the same paths. Rather, they train their children to walk and become better. Beloved, God has a plan for your life, and He has placed wonderful treasures in you. There is no one on earth for whom God doesn't have a plan. From the homeless man on the street to the child born in the palace, each one was placed here on earth for a reason. If you can turn your eyes from the failures, setbacks, and flaws of your present and start embracing who God says you really are, and if you can use that same energy to see the value you carry, you are in for a world of wonders bound to happen. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 19, For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. You are one of those children of God the world is awaiting. You may not see it now, but God has put a glorious destiny in you that Satan wants to destroy if you let him convince you to quit. God's servant, Joyce Meyer, once said, The more we focus on who we are in Christ, the less it matters who we were in the past, or even what happens to us. The key question here is that you are as solid as the object of your focus. If you think you have failed too many times, if you have made so many mistakes, if you have missed so many opportunities, and if you have not been able to reach certain expectations, I have good news for you. You are the person God wants to use for great things. Am I serious? Oh yes, I am, my friend. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. If you weren't so important to God, the devil wouldn't be coming after you. Let that sink in. So, before you give up on yourself, here are a few things to consider. Before you were born, God knew you and designed you with a plan for fulfillment. He knew you would experience many things. He knew you would fail. He knew you would be so stubborn, make life difficult for your parents and loved ones for a while and get into trouble. He knew that you would get stuck in cycles for a long time. He knew the things that would happen to you, yet He still chose you, not only to be born into the world, but also to be saved. David wrote something similar in Psalms chapter 139, verses 13 through 16. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Like I said at the beginning of this video, David and everyone else who God used to fulfill his agenda on the earth had their limitations, flaws, and setbacks. Many of them did things you wouldn't dare to do, yet God used them. If Moses had given up because his effort to save his people while he was in Egypt failed, resulting in his exile, he wouldn't have become the savior whom God used to bring them out. If Joseph had blamed himself for talking too much or blamed his brothers and Potiphar's wife for being unkind to him, he wouldn't have reached his destiny and fulfilled God's plan for his life. What about Abraham, who had to wait for God's promise of Isaac for 25 years? What about Jacob, who was known as a trickster all his life until God changed his name to Israel? What about Peter, Paul, and the others? You can look through scriptures and find the stories of these people as examples and inspiration. You can believe and embrace God's plan for your life, and you can choose to follow the path God carves out for you. God chose you, not because you were perfect as a person, but because you were perfect for His plan. God chose you and placed you on earth, and you are alive today because He is not done with you yet. There is a destiny in front of you, and you have everything it takes to fulfill it. Don't worry about how you feel. 
You have all it takes to be the person God designed you to be. Don't worry about the things going on in your life right now. The failures are disappointments. Yes, many of them will show areas where you need to make improvements. Many will show areas where you need to do or stop doing certain things. However, never let anything make you doubt God's plan for your life or give up on yourself. Rick Warren said, You were made by God and for God, and until you understand that, life will never make sense. One day, you are going to stand before your Heavenly Father. I pray that when you do, you will have lived out His plans completely on the earth and enjoyed the beautiful adventure of demonstrating the glory of God. Amen. Do you know one of the signs that you have given your life to God, and correctly so, is when you decide to move on from your past? One of the hallmarks of genuine repentance is the forsaking of the past. No man can walk into his destiny and future looking backward. The baggage and weight that your past represents becomes an extra drag on your life and destiny when you decide to keep living in it. The past most times represents things that we do not want to remember or things that we shouldn't hold on to. People who have chosen the way of the future and their destiny must first of all as a matter of urgency decide to leave their past. There are people, occurrences, decisions, relationships, losses, and victories must be left in the past if the journey of the future must be embarked on. In my lifetime, I have seen people who were so caught up in the glory of their past that they forgot to attend to their present, which effectively ended their future. One of the dangers of the past is its ability to keep you in it, while the rest of the world just goes on. Victories and wins that should be stepping stones for more become a graveyard for many because they never move on from them. The past is just a graveyard for memories and a store for lessons. If you do not let your mind remember this every time, you stand a chance of being stuck in it. I met a lady in school, a very lively lady. She was always chatting with everyone when the lecturer hadn't come to class. We realized she was way older than the rest of us. But one day, we were asked to make a presentation in class and it was a practical philosophy class, and we had to be as real as possible. This lady stood in front of the class and narrated a story that left the whole class silent, including the lecturers. Horrific stories of kidnap, abuse, and even having a child from that. A couple of years later, I ran into her at a classmate's wedding, and I found the courage to ask her why she was always that chatty and happy with such a background, and she told me this. I lost the past, gained a present from it, and I intend to change my future. There's nothing left in the past for me. Listen to me, child of God. I don't know what you left in the past. I don't know how bad the loss was or how great those victories were. There's nothing left for you in the past. Move on and leave that place. The book of Philippians 3.13 says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Paul the Apostle while addressing the Philippians says he tries as much as possible to forget the things in the past and move ahead into the things of his future. Listen to me once again, nobody makes it into the future residing and dwelling on the past. Going on in his address in verse 14 of Philippians 3, Paul says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You must press on. Forgetting the things of the past, you must press on towards your goals, and most importantly, toward the goals that God has set for you. What does God have for you? What does the future hold for you? What are you leaving your past for? The reason why many people do not find it easy to move ahead is that they don't have anything in their future to hold on to. The future is scary when there's no plan for it. The hope in the future is what Jesus guarantees when you decide to give your life to Him. 
but you must press on while forgetting your past. Pressing on is moving on at whatever cost. The Apostle Paul didn't say it was easy. He says he strains to press on. Straining has to do with exerting force against an opposing force. You must accept God's purpose and plans for your destiny. Listen to me. There's no record of a man who pressed on after God, left everything behind, and God left him stranded. How do you move on from your past and into God's plan and purpose for your destiny? By accepting God's grace. Listen to me. The grace of God is the only access point to your purpose and destiny. The reason why you receive anything at all is by grace. Even the gift of salvation is by grace. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 16, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The way to your destiny is through the grace of God. The grace of God which has been made available to you is the only way you can access your destiny in Him. God's grace and purpose for your destiny is carried in His abilities to change your life, from the point you are to the point you should be. That is only possible if you allow His grace to operate in your life. The whole essence of having God in your life is to put your life and destiny on the path to fulfillment through the grace of God which He makes available for us at any time should we need it. The availability of grace has never been in question, but our ability to accept it and surrender to it becomes a challenge to us because we always think we know better than God. Like I always tell people, after you give your life to Jesus Christ, the next thing that happens is the activity of grace and the grace of God is geared toward your destiny. When you accept the grace of God to take the full control over your life, your destiny becomes the focus of His grace in your life. Hear me, child of God. The reason why you feel your life is not taking off the way you feel it should might be because you are having a problem with surrendering to God's grace. What is God's purpose for your life and destiny? to bring you into fellowship with Him and for His glory. The creation of the first man, Adam, was for the sole purpose of His availability to commune with God. The Bible says in Genesis that God came down from heaven in the cool of the evening into the Garden of Eden on earth to have a chat and fellowship with Adam. God's ultimate purpose for your life is bigger than our imaginations. Your career and professions might constitute a major part of God's purpose for your life, but the ultimate purpose of God for your life is your fellowship with Him and glorify Him. God says in the book of Isaiah 43, 21, that this person have I formed for myself, they shall shew forth my praise. I will say this once again, the first purpose of God's creation, Adam, was to show forth His glory and for His fellowship with Him. Do not get it twisted ever in your life that your only purpose of creation lies in your physical manifestations. That's the way a fool thinks when he imagines that there's no God. Your creation was and is for fellowship with God and to show forth His glory. Men who have surrendered to the grace of God putting all their attention on the things of God and forgetting their past are crowned with glory because they spent their lives and their time existing with God in their purpose. The life of God begins to rub off on you as you are in constant fellowship with Him and that means the glory of the God who dwells in glory begins to rub off on you and your life becomes a reference point to the world. Glorification happens. There are men who are presently among us who have spent all their lives and energy staying in the current purpose of God for their lives and destinies. And today, we regard them as the best among us because they know where to get the glory from, existing in His grace. 
Another purpose of God for your life and destiny is to bring you to the perfection of it. Do not be deceived, my dear child of God. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. I am yet to see the man who sold his life to evil and ripped so much good from evil. The gift of God is without repentance, and it's always good because it is specific to an assignment in your life. The only God who can bring you perfection is the perfect God. I know this might sound very familiar, but the Word of God stands true always. The plans of God for your life are way bigger than your imagination. He told Jeremiah that, I know the plans I have for you, of good and not of evil, to bring you into an expected future. What is that future you're expecting? You cannot feature in the future you have pictured through the eyes of God. No man stands backward at the mirror and sees his reflections. He must turn and face the mirror if he must see his reflection. If you must feature in the future, you must turn and stand before God and view your life through the lens of His Word. Have you ever considered what Jeremiah 1.5 says? It says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. You are not a mistake. God knew the plans He had for you before He made you. Remember when I said, your existence goes way beyond your physical manifestations? You are an integral part of God's mighty army and He made you specifically to answer a generational question. So cheer up, be of good spirit, keep your head up, and focus your mind on God and on His purpose for your life. The devil might be saying something, and life might have gone wrong somewhere, but believe me, God still has a purpose for your life. Your present conditions are not hindrances to God nor His plans. That's the work of grace. It qualifies you for things that normally you will not get. Whenever your situations stare you down, remind yourself of the fact that Jesus is still Lord and you are part of His plans. When you let sorrow fill your heart, it keeps you in a bind. And as long as you remain in this bind, you will struggle to see the good around you. However, when you let God remove the garment of sorrow and break its chains off of you, your life can begin to experience the fullness of God's best. God was speaking to Christ in Isaiah 61 verse 3, that He would anoint Him to minister freedom and joy to His people according to the Father's will. And provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. The phrase garment of praise is a metaphor for the gladness and thanksgiving God's people feel when they are filled with the joy of the Lord. Remember that the Bible says that God's joy is the strength of His people. Also remember that the Bible says you will only draw water from the well of salvation through joy. This means that when you stay in sorrow, sadness, depression, or desolation, you keep yourself bound by an invisible chain that keeps you in thirst and dryness, so much that even though you are standing by the well of your salvation, you have nothing with which to draw out its blessings and privileges. So many believers are letting sorrow control their lives today. What does sorrow even mean? To be sorrowful means to be overwhelmed by a deep feeling of sadness, grief and regret. Sadness of heart is not always related to an underlying health condition. It may be caused by disappointments, challenging events, emotional hurt, or a loss of something or someone. Sometimes, because they failed to do or not to do something in the past, some people subject themselves to living in constant regret, blaming themselves about it, 
And as long as you stay in this position, you may never even see anything good in yourself, in your life, or in the ones God is planting around you. What about the person who attempts a venture numerous times only to be disappointed again and again? They may begin to use their disappointments to define themselves. If you are not careful, the sadness of not getting the dream job, going to the dream school, growing your business the way you planned, or breaking out of a cycle of life can have a great impact on your spirit, so much that you become controlled by it. Because you failed or met disappointment should not define you, my friend. God has called you to a life of miracles and testimonies. Let me ask you this. What is the main thing that validates victory? Challenges and oppositions. How can you say you won when there was never a contest nor an opposition? Would you say you won when there was nothing trying to make you fail? Not really. Hence, when sorrow knocks on your door, you must remember that you must never let it control your life. Now, there are two kinds of sorrows mentioned in the Bible. The first is referred to as godly sorrow. The second is referred to as worldly sorrow. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. What is godly sorrow? It is usually a feeling of sadness within your spirit when you are not walking in the will of God. You may have felt it when you made a mistake or disobeyed God and you had to quickly go back and pray for forgiveness. It's stirred up by the Holy Spirit of God within a believer to keep them aware of how God feels about things He isn't pleased with in our lives. You see, because you have the Spirit of God, when something in your life displeases God, you will sense it. The Bible calls this grieving the Spirit. It means that the Spirit of God within you isn't pleased by that speech, reaction, thought, choice, etc. The outcome is that if a person truly loves and fears God, they will not be pleased with themselves. Thus, they have sorrow in their spirits. The goal of this is to bring you to repentance, to turn from that thing. Hence, the Bible says it leaves no regret. Rather, it leads to salvation. Every true child of God, should seek to be sensitive enough in their spirit to experience godly sorrow. It helps us examine our hearts and stay on the right path with the help of the Holy Spirit. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 139, 23 through 24, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David understood that as long as his heart was right before God, he would lead them into everlasting life. Godly sorrow is a believer's advantage. It leads to restoration, consecration, repentance, joy, and salvation. On the other hand, worldly sorrow brings nothing but death. While godly sorrow leads you to see how much God loves you and wants you to be a better person, Worldly sorrow makes you see nothing good about yourself, about life, or about other people. Does this mean that if you lose a loved one, you shouldn't grieve? No, that's not what I mean. The Bible does not condemn you from grieving. However, it instructs us to make sure we are not grieving like the world. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind, who have no hope. How does the world grieve? They grieve with hopelessness. They grieve like they have lost everything. They grieve like it's the end of the world. They allow their loss today to define their tomorrow. They allow their pain and regrets to define them and give them new identities. I once heard a woman who lost one of her children. By the way the death of that child affected her, you could tell that this was her favorite child. After the death of her daughter, her life seemed to just stop. She became desolate. She stopped caring for herself, the rest of her young children, and her husband. 
No one could understand how she became so hopeless over the death of her child when she still had her other children and her family to comfort her. This was the work of the devil. You see, Satan knows that as long as you let him in, he can gain ground in your life. And whatever ground you give him in your life, he turns into a stronghold. So when sorrow becomes a stronghold, it can begin to control your life until you become a walking description of it. On the other hand, when you let God break the chains of sorrow in your life, you will experience life's true joy. How do you let God break the chains of sorrow in your life? No matter how many points I share on how to do this, they will be built around this one thing. Have faith in God. Jesus explains in John 14, 1 and in verse 27. John 14, 1 Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. John 14, 27 Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. One of the most powerful proofs of faith is peace. Peace is not the absence of trouble. Peace is not living in denial. Instead, peace is the outcome of an inner witness that regardless of what has happened, what may be happening, or what could happen, God is in control and all things will work together for your good. Peace is steadily advancing through the storm without letting the storm around you become the storm within you. This peace only comes from above and it has the power to break the control of sorrow and fill you with joy instead. So here is how it works. If you want to break the chains of sorrow in your life, you must have faith in the integrity of God. The integrity of God is in His Word. God is bound to honor His Word in your life according to His will and in His name. So even if you are dealing with grief, sadness, or regret over something in your life, God is saying, I'm aware of your hurts and your pains. Let me heal you. Turn to me. I have greater plans in store for you. Take my hand and walk with me. Yes, you have been burned. Now it's time to rise out of the ashes. Yes, you have been broken. Now it's time for me to put your pieces back together in a more beautiful design. The Word of God is full of God's promises about restoration, healing, peace, and miraculous turnarounds of situations. And since faith comes by hearing God's Word, get into the Word of God more every day. Learn to spend time reading the Bible, meditating on God's promises concerning you, especially in that area of sorrow. When you spend time with the world, soon its light will shine into your spirit. And Jesus said, the truth shall make you free. How will the truth of God's word set you free from the grip of sorrow? In the word, you will find everything God has said about his plans for you and his thoughts concerning you. Once that sinks in, you will learn what it means when the Bible says that no matter what happens to you, it will turn out for your good. Once the word sinks in, you will discover that the hope of the believer is not based on the things they get or lose here on earth. The believer's hope is eternal. It lies in the realm where there cannot be damage or loss. It abides forever. I could go on and on. However, these revelations will give birth to faith in your spirit, which in turn will open you up to new waves of God's peace and joy. So instead of being sad and sorrowful, you will be filled with joy and praise because you know who you are in God. Do you see that letting sorrow control your life will only leave you at a disadvantage? It's time to rise into new advantages in God by letting Him break the chains of sorrow and fill you with His peace and joy instead. Your best is still in front of you. There is no room for fear or sorrow. You are a child of God. Rise up to your inheritance in Him. Thank God for everything and thank Him in advance for the blessings to come. I know that you know how to thank God, but do you honestly thank God for everything? Do you thank God even for the things yet to come? Thanksgiving operates at a higher level of faith, 
and it requires even more faith when you thank God for things you haven't seen yet. The thing about this powerful act is that whatever future blessing you can consistently thank God for in your life will eventually become yours. Today, permit me to encourage you about the power of thanksgiving and how to thank God for the blessings to come. What are you most grateful for in your life? I have watched people share testimonies during church services, and they roll on the floor as a way of thanking God for the great miracles He did for them. They were healed of a very terrible affliction. Debts were cleared. They got a new job. They bought a new house. And they started a business worth millions even when they didn't have a dime. Do you know how excited and grateful we become when we receive a blessing? During a housewarming, business opening ceremony, and other remarkable events, we express our gratitude to God for everything He has done for us with eloquent speech, tears, singing, or dancing. We narrate how long we have waited to have it, how hard we tried, how much effort we made, or even how much the one who gave us the gift loved or cared for us. We do this both with God and men. I believe God, just like us, delights in our gratitude for the things He does for us. In fact, Jesus made us realize that God looks forward to it. When He healed ten lepers, the Bible says that only one of them returned to thank Him for the miracle. Jesus inquired about the others before He further blessed the man who came back. There are two lessons to note from that story. Number one, God expects us to give thanks when we see His hands in our lives. The Bible says in Psalms 103, 1-4, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion? It doesn't speak well of you if you easily forget the things God does for you. I will speak more about the power of gratitude as we progress in a minute. Number 2. When you thank God for His work in your life, you open yourself up for more blessings from Him. You see, there is a significant characteristic shared by every person you will meet as you go through life. People like to be appreciated. Gratitude creates an open door between the giver and the receiver. Ingratitude, on the other hand, shuts the door. This works the same way with God. He recognizes those who express their gratitude and He goes on to bless them further. Jesus did this with the leper who returned to give thanks to Him. If you treat people who express appreciation for what you are doing in a more special way than those who don't, isn't it likely that God, even though He's not a man, will do the same? You see, this is in no way comparing God and man. God is not a man. He does not copy men. Rather, whatever we do that looks similar to God's behavior just proves that we are His creation and share some of His characteristics. After all, the Bible says that we were created in His image. Thanking God for everything proves to God that you recognize His existence and you acknowledge that He is behind what you are seeing in your life. Thanking God also proves that you believe in His power and have done what you are thanking Him for. This is why praise and thanksgiving are weapons. Remember that the Bible tells us that the believer's weapons of warfare are not physical or man-made weapons. Rather, they are spiritual weapons, mighty through God for pulling down strongholds. Now, we have the weapon of prayer, and then we have the weapon of praise. Now, the weapon of praise is powerful because it hinges more on the strength of faith than on anything else. Thanksgiving takes its time to think about the past and the present. It takes time to weigh the chances on its own verses with God. And it comes to the conclusion that God has been good. It's not blind. Rather, it comes from a place of deep gratitude and joy. Knowing through all these situations, God has been watching over you and taking care of you. 
Lamentations 3, 21 through 23. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Thanksgiving means you recall the things that have happened, and in that faith, you stand to bless the name of God who, though you can't see Him, reveals Himself through His working in your life. The enemy can take our ingratitude and use it against us. He can continue to keep your eyes shut from everything God does for you until you get to a point where you feel entitled to it, even though it's nothing short of a privilege given by grace and mercy. Now, Thanksgiving is divided into two categories. First, there is thanking God for everything He has done in the past and what He is doing in the present. Second, there is thanking God for the blessings yet to come. So far, I have tried to show you the power of thanksgiving. However, there is more. You see, thanksgiving and praise go hand in hand. They both take into account what God does, even when the circumstances want them to take into account the negativity around you. Psalms 22, 3-5 But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. Look, God delighting in your praise is not Him asking you to live in denial. No, instead He wants you to declare your faith in Him by doing the opposite of what the enemy wants you to do. You see, when life happens to you, the enemy wants you to complain, quit, or murmur against God. He wants to see you set your feelings aside and focus on Him on what He has done and who He is. Believe me, if you want to see reasons not to praise God, Satan can give you a million and one reasons. However, if you make up your mind to thank God, even if it is for the gift of life alone, you will see God working on your behalf. Praise is an act of faith, and it has the power to move God from His throne to work on your behalf. And as much as thanking God for all He has done and is doing now is great, you can do the unusual, which is thanking God in advance for the blessings that are yet to come into your life. This requires even greater faith, but you must remember that we are children of faith. The Bible says that the just, which includes you and I in Christ, should live by faith. Through faith, praise glorifies God not for the things that have been seen or experienced, but for what is yet to come. This takes God by His word and takes hold of the promises He has made. When you begin to thank God ahead of time for the promotion, the employment, the new home, the peaceful marriage, the blessed children, and for everything you want but have yet to see, you stand in the place of faith. It may not require as much faith to thank God for what you can see, but it does require a little more faith to thank Him in advance. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony, and by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Faith brings you spiritually into the future you desire and causes you to appreciate God like one who has received that future. It becomes your truth, your reality, your reason to rejoice and to laugh, your confidence in God. God then has another reason to visit you, to move in your life. Scriptures tell us something unique about the person of God. His eyes are always looking around the earth for people whose hearts are on Him. Why? He is almost at the edge of His seat, in a sense, with deep eagerness to demonstrate His power on behalf of those who trust Him enough to not only live for Him, but to have faith in His power. 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9 for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. 
You have done a foolish thing, and from now on, you will be at war. I really wish these words would penetrate into your spirit so that you understand and embrace this attitude. Life can be quite difficult and God is aware of this. Things can press you so hard that sometimes you feel like if you have yet to see something you've been asking for, there is no point of even thanking God for it. However, you must realize something about God. He does not mess around with His promises or the faith of His people. Just as we saw in the verse above, rather He loves the challenge. He loves to be trusted so that He can prove to you that He is worth trusting. Besides this, thanking God in advance will remove the fears and pressures of the future for which you are giving thanks. When you praise God in advance, the first thing He does is offer peace to your heart. So when others are panicking, all you do is thank Him. Because you know He has heard and will do what you've been thanking Him for. The Bible says in Isaiah 26 verse 3, You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. This means that God makes it His own responsibility to protect your heart with peace from the enemy's attacks because you are living inside the security of praise and thanksgiving in advance. So like Jesus before the tomb of Lazarus, you will speak before the unfavorable circumstances and say, Thank you, Father, because I know you always hear me. Thanking God in advance is the best way to make your request known to God because it is done in faith. When you have faith to thank God for leveling your mountains, know that when you come before that mountain, God will have moved it into the seas. Start today, my friend. Recognize the power of praise and begin to develop the attitude of thanking God for all things, past, present, and future. Whatever you give more attention to grows. You will witness your faith grow and the power of God manifest in your life when you keep your eyes focused on Him in times of trouble. Let me encourage you with these words from a story in Matthew 14. One day, Jesus asked the disciples to travel to the other side of the Lake of Galilee in a boat while He stayed behind to pray. In the middle of the night, the Bible says that a great storm arose and beat the boat about in the water. As they struggled with the waves, they saw Jesus coming to them, walking on water. They screamed that it was a ghost, but He assured them that it was Him. Then Peter said, Lord, if it's you, ask me to come to you on the water. Of course, Peter was a fisherman and knew that it wasn't natural to walk on water. So he knew it must take divine power to walk or make another walk on water. Jesus replied to him, Come. Immediately, the Bible says that he got out of the boat and amid the waves and raging storm began to walk toward Jesus on the water. Step by step, as he kept his eyes on Jesus, Peter came closer and closer, walking on the water. Then he turned to the storm and saw the raging sea. He saw the storm beating their boat left and right, and he realized he was standing in the midst of the storm. Immediately he became afraid and began to sink. Then he cried out to Jesus for help. Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him before he could get lost at sea. Matthew 14, 31 Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? When they got back on the boat, the wind ceased instantly as they all marveled at the majesty of Jesus. This story is not so different from the reality you might find yourself in today. I hope that the Lord manifests himself on your behalf. It gives you a miracle out of all the unfavorable circumstances in your life, in Jesus' name. However, no matter what happens in your life or what's happening right now, never take your eyes off the Lord. The story of Peter and Jesus in the middle of the raging storm teaches us that as long as your focus is on Jesus, your situation will never overthrow you. But the moment you take your focus away from Him, you open yourself up to be occupied by the enemy and He will not waste time to overthrow you. One of the greatest damages you can do to your faith is to turn your focus away from the only place where true help comes from, from God. 
What does it mean to keep your focus on God? It means to count on Him as your source, your only way out. It means to take His promises as true, to stand on them, trusting that at the right time, He will bring them to pass. To keep your focus on God is to rest in Him and stay secured not by the things you see around you, but by the faith that He will never leave nor abandon you in trouble. Haven't you realized that everything the devil's trying to do is make you give up on waiting on God, get mad at Him, or consider options other than what He may have promised? The enemy knows that he can't do anything as long as your gaze is on Jesus. Like Peter, gazing on Jesus doesn't take the storm away. Instead, it keeps you afloat. However, if you lose focus, the power of the storm will overthrow you. This is the difference between those who stand in faith and those whose faith has given out. One turned away and allowed the venom of fear to enter, and they began to sink. Another kept their gaze, and they rode out the storm until the end. David wrote in Psalms 121, 1-2, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth. Why is it so important that he lifted his eyes beyond the hills and mountains, which represent connections and human powers? The next verse tells us, Psalms 121, 3 to 8. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. I love this chapter of the Psalms because it breaks down the work of God's solution in your life when you let Him intervene for you. You see, when God is working on a person's behalf, He doesn't do a half-baked job. He always finishes whatever He started. The psalmist shares reasons why we must keep our eyes on God. 1. He will not let your foot slip. Doesn't this remind you of Peter? He lost his footing only as he took his gaze off Jesus. As long as his eyes were on Jesus, all that could sink people in the water was suspended. Beloved, there is no doubt you're battling with your current situation. However, if you let God have your attention like you've given it to the situation, you will see changes. Realize that more often than not, your situations are only as powerful as their hold on your mind. This means that when you don't let the issue get into your heart or into your head, it can't rob you of your joy and make you desperate, frustrated, sad, or hopeless. And the only way for this to happen is to take your focus off the situation and place it on God. Your feet your faith, your courage, your hopes, and your resolve weaken each time you think about the disadvantages around you. However, with God before you, you can see possibilities, a future, and a miracle. A helper who cannot be bound by where you're coming from or where you're going to. Are you struggling to stand lately? Then check what has your attention. 2. He watches over you. One of the reasons you must keep your focus on God is that He's the only one who watches over you all the time. You may find alternative help elsewhere, but no one else will be there for you all the time. There's a God who always watches over you and will be there even on your darkest nights. Is there anyone on earth worth focusing on other than the one who's got your back all the time? 3. He will keep you from all harm. Harm can mean anything in your life that threatens your peace. The Bible says you look up to God because He's the only one who can keep you from harm. What most of us don't know is that people who help us can only postpone the harm or disaster for a time. But there's only one who can completely eliminate it so that you don't have to worry about it coming now or later. Dear child of God, your heavenly Father is the only shield you need. Take as many security measures as you can afford, 
Only he can give you a 100% guarantee that evil will not come. And even if it should appear, he will preserve you by his own hand. Psalms 91, 9-13 If you say, The Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. By making God your refuge, you're keeping your focus on him. By focusing on him, you're bringing yourself under his preservation. He has promised that whoever waits on him will never be put to shame. Even when it seems like all hell's broken loose and is attacking you from all sides and everyone's mocking your faith. These three reasons should make you resolve to never take your eyes off of them. Are you facing a hard time in your life? I encourage you to turn to the one place where there's safety. There's no safety in the hills, not in an uncle, not in one promised connection here or there. But there is safety in the Lord Himself, who promises to be a place of refuge, a sanctuary for those who trust in Him. Ezekiel 37, 26 I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers, and I will put my sanctuary among them forever. If you've taken your eyes off the Lord and you'd like to place them back and keep your focus on Him, like Peter, you can cry out for His help right now. Peter cried, Lord, save me. When we take our focus away from God, we will drown in despair and in sorrows. But when we call out to Him in our despair, He will reach out His mercy and save us like He did Peter. Don't continue to sink and hope it'll get better. You have to cry out to God, Lord, save me. This cry says, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I'm overwhelmed. I thought I could handle the pressure. I thought I had it all figured out, but I admit this is more than I can handle. Help me, Lord, save me lest I drown. This is the cry of the one who trusts God and not himself. It is the beginning of focusing on God. Will you make a prayer today and ask God to help you keep your eyes on Him? In this day and age where many are falling out of the faith because of the pressures of problems, temptations, distractions, fear, and uncertainty, ask Him to help you stay focused and not lose your feet until the end when we all see His glory. Trust God to bring the right people in your life. You need people in your life, not for the reasons you may think, but far beyond that. You don't need people for validation or simply for acceptance. God himself loves and accepts you already. He demonstrated that through the sacrifice of his only son, Jesus, for our sins. Not because we deserve it, but simply because he loves us. Romans 5.8 but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So don't think of relationships as just to have people who like you in your life. Life is deeper than that. Did you know that one could be walking down a destructive path in life and still be surrounded by people who are like them? This can deceive them to think that because they have people who understand what they're doing, it validates them and nothing else matters. This reminds me of what Jesus once said in one of his teachings about the Pharisees and teachers of the law of his day. Matthew 15, 14 Leave them, they are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. No matter how many people you have around you, if you're all on the wrong path, you will all end at the wrong destination. It is, therefore, a necessity that you trust God to help you identify and connect with the right people in your life. You need them, my friend. There is so much benefit, too numerous to count, in having the right people in your life. We'll see some of them in a bit. 
So many destinies have suffered shipwreck, not because the individuals were bad people, but because they allowed the wrong people to influence their lives. Look around you. Do the people in your life reflect the kind of future you want to have in God? I'm not talking about making money or having worldly connections to high places. You may have seasons in your life when you need connections, but you have to see beyond that. For instance, you may consider a relationship valuable because it helps you meet your material needs, only for you to discover that it contributes to your departure from the faith. You see, the most important thing to the Christian is his or her faith. Without faith, a Christian can't do anything. Without faith, a Christian can't live the life God wants him or her to live. Without faith, a Christian can't enter God's kingdom. Without faith, a Christian is not a Christian. Hebrews 11.6 And without faith, it's impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. You can have many things in this world when you bow down to the devil. Remember that Satan told Jesus that he would give Jesus everything this world could offer if he would only bow down to him in worship. He acknowledged that all those things were within his power to give to whomever he wished. Matthew 4, 9 All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Of course, Jesus refused and rebuked him. However, this is a clear indication that being successful according to the standard of this world does not necessarily require faith in God. There are many celebrities and wealthy people on the earth today who have never bowed down to Jesus. There are many individuals doing well in their businesses and careers through their own power and other ungodly means. However, you need to understand that life is beyond just these physical acquisitions. When God blesses a person, He does it completely. There is no underlying regret or destructive repercussion waiting to happen. And above all, you have an eternal hope in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Why is this so important to note concerning having the right people in your life? You see, every day you're living a part of your life story, one page at a time. For this story, God has a plan and place for you to live, but your enemy, the devil, also has his plans for you. The plan you live out until you leave this world will determine your eternal destination, either heaven or hell. But God has a special purpose for putting you there. Regardless of what you're going through or may have gone through, his plans are good and perfect for you. And every day it's his intentions to bring it to pass in your life. So, the script you align with, either God's or the devil's, will greatly influence how your life turns out in the end. You don't want to look back and wish you'd listened to every available counsel and opportunity that came your way. You don't want to look back and wish you never met some people because of how they caused so much damage to you. This is the reason God's bringing this video your way today. Please don't miss this valuable message. God made us for valuable associations. From the day you were born until the day you will die, you will need people to help you move from one phase of life to another. Each of these people will contribute directly or indirectly into your life. Some may come accidentally, while some may be there intentionally. Some may pass by temporarily, while some may stay longer. Whichever kind, one of your greatest assets to possess in life must be to have the right people in your life. Let me give you different instances of the value of the right people in your life, as well as the effect of the wrong people, too. Every impactful person whom God used in the Bible had one or more influential people in their lives who helped them find their way, not only in destiny, but also in God. You can't talk about Esther without Mordecai, her uncle. You can't talk about Lot growing into a great man without Abraham, his uncle. In fact, even after turning his back on Abraham, we still find Abraham interceding for his safety when God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Can we talk about the life of David without his mighty warriors who stayed with him in the cave when he had nothing until he became king over all Israel? Or can we forget the influence the prophets Samuel and Nathan had in his life? 
Nathan, for instance, was instrumental in David's repentance when he slept with Bathsheba and killed her husband Uriah. How about Joseph? Once his father sent him to seek out his brothers for the last time before he was sold into slavery. He was lost, wandering alone in the fields when a complete stranger met him and gave him directions to find his brothers. You see, his destiny was about to be triggered, and each person had a role to play. If he had not met this man, maybe he wouldn't have been sold. And if Joseph had returned home, how would he have ended up in Egypt, gone on to become the prime minister who saved thousands, if not millions of lives during the seven-year famine? How would he have gotten the opportunity to interpret the Pharaoh's dream, or even appear in his presence, if he had not come in a brief but significant contact with Pharaoh's servant? the cupbearer in prison. Elisha had Elijah. Elijah had the widow of Seraphat who fed him during the famine. Elijah also had a couple who supported his ministry with their resources too. Finally, our Lord Jesus, who is our perfect example. When he walked the earth, even though he was God, he still made sure that apart from the crowd that followed him, he had the right set of people around him. Listen, our Lord Jesus was kind and good. He was a sinner's friend and was there to help those who needed his help. However, he did not make himself available to everyone, nor did he rely on every person he met. John 2, 24-25 But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Yet he had those he called friends, men and women alike, not perfect, but whom he trusted and could rely on to fulfill his destiny. Among them were former prostitutes, former tax collectors, former freedom fighters, betrayers, Pharisees who believed in him, and politicians who sincerely sought God. These people stood out, and in the end, we saw the roles they played in his life and ministry. But there is something we can see and learn from Jesus. He prayed before pinpointing his closest friends, the twelve disciples. He didn't just pick them because they looked nice, were successful, had experiences, or any physical traits like we do many times. Instead, Jesus chose to trust God to bring the right individuals into his life, who would serve God's purpose in his life, as well as help them fulfill their own destinies. Luke 6, 12-13 One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them, whom he also designated apostles. Through his prayers, Jesus was not only declaring his trust in God to bring the right people, but also to guide him to the right people. We can see this guidance when he had a longing to go to Samaria where he would meet a Samaritan woman at the well. He would end up touching her life, turning her into the first female gospel announcer in the New Testament. If Jesus could trust God to bring the right people to his life, you can trust God for the same also. You are God's child, and it's his desire to see you safe and fulfilled. And to do this, he will position the right people at different phases of your life. Some to guide and correct, some to teach, some to comfort and encourage you, some to defend and stand by you, and others to keep you company till you become all that you were ordained to be. You cannot do everything by yourself. Therefore, you need to trust God to bring the right people into your life to help you. Ask Him to give you a discerning heart to be able to recognize them when they come. One great feature of these people is that they'll help you seek God, get closer to Him, and support you in fulfilling your God-given purpose in life. You miss a great deal if you miss these people. Therefore, it's very important that you trust God to bring them. They may not look like it, but trust God. They may not have what you think you need at the time because of where they are or what they look like, but trust God. He knows what he's doing. At the end of the day, the right people will bring out the best in you, leaving you stronger and better in God than the way they met you.
Let God guide you, my friend. You need the right people in your life. They will make your journey easier and smoother. As believers in Jesus, we have been adopted into God's family. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God, and that is something to celebrate. But being a child of God doesn't just mean that we have a new title or a new identity. It means that we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Just like the tabernacle and temple housed the presence of God in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God now dwells within us. How incredible is that? And because of that, there is nowhere we can go where God is not with us. The Bible tells us in Psalm 139, 7-10, Where can I go from your Spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. Isn't that amazing? No matter where we are or what we're going through, God is always with us. And not only is He with us, but He is guiding us and holding us fast. We are never alone. But being a child of God also comes with some challenges. Just like any good parent, God wants what's best for us. And sometimes, that means we will face difficult situations. We will face trials and struggles. We will face things that will test our faith. But the good news is that we don't have to face those things alone. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, guiding us and strengthening us. And we also have a community of believers that can come alongside us and support us in those times of need. As 2 Corinthians 6.16 says, For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. We are the temple of the living God, and that is something to be proud of. It's a reminder that we have a purpose and a calling on our lives, and that we are never alone in fulfilling that calling. So today, I want to encourage you to remember that you are a child of God. You are loved, you are valued, and you are never alone. No matter what you're going through, God is with you every step of the way. So hold on to that truth and let it give you the strength and courage you need to face whatever comes your way. We believe that our advantage in this world is solely related to how much of God we have in us. When we strive to know God more, our lives become more meaningful and purposeful. Let's take a look at the lives of people who walked with God versus those who didn't. There is a clear difference, right? Most of the people who made an impact in the days of the Bible were people who committed themselves to God. They did great things to the degree to which the presence of God was with them. When Jesus was leaving, He said that He wouldn't leave us as orphans. This is such an important statement because He knew the importance of His presence in our lives. That's why He sent the Holy Spirit. Jesus spoke extensively about the Holy Spirit and gave His disciples the instruction to wait in Jerusalem for Him to come. When the Holy Spirit eventually came, there was a clear difference between the apostles who followed Jesus and the ones whom the Holy Spirit empowered. The Holy Spirit is the only reason why they were able to do what they did and they did it well. The Holy Spirit continues to empower anyone who is interested in doing phenomenal things around the world. God sent His Holy Spirit to transform our hearts and make us more Christ-like. He knew that we needed help in living a righteous life that pleases Him. Without God's help, we are unable to live the kind of life that God desires for us to have. As believers in Jesus Christ, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit works in us and helps us mature as believers and brings about the transformation of our hearts and minds. We are no longer slaves to sin, but we are children of God. 
So, what does it mean to have God's presence in our lives? It means that we have the power of the Holy Spirit living in us, guiding us and leading us. It means that we have a helper who intercedes for us when we don't know what to pray for. It means that we have the power to overcome sin and to live a life that pleases God. In Romans 8.14, it says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. This means that when we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, we are truly living as children of God. We are not just living for ourselves, but we are living for the glory of God. So, if you are struggling with sin, if you feel like you are not living the kind of life that God desires for you to have, remember that you are a child of God. You have the power of the Holy Spirit living in you and He is able to transform your life. All you have to do is surrender your life to Him and allow Him to work in you. As the Bible tells us in Titus 3, 4-6 states, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. When we carry the presence of God in us, we undergo a complete transformation. It's not about improving ourselves or becoming better people. It's about becoming a new creation. Just like a caterpillar transforms into a butterfly, we too become new beings. It's an incredible experience that changes not just our behavior, but our entire lives. Others will notice the change in us. People around us will see that something is different about us, even if they don't know what it is. When God's presence is in us, it's like a beacon shining brightly for others to see. So, what happens when we carry the presence of God? We experience supernatural favor. Favor is when we have loyalty in the hearts of men and it's not something we can wish for or create ourselves. The Bible tells us that the heart of man is desperately wicked, and it's rare for someone to go out of their way to benefit someone else. But with favor, people will be compelled to do things that benefit us, even if they're strangers or enemies. Secondly, we experience the manifest presence of God. This is when we are aware of God's presence and feel it in every aspect of our lives. It's an incredible feeling that brings peace, joy, and a sense of purpose. We experience supernatural guidance. When we carry God's presence, we have access to His wisdom and guidance. We are able to make better decisions and avoid mistakes because we're connected to the One who knows all things. And lastly, we experience supernatural protection. When we carry God's presence, we are protected from harm and evil. It's like having a shield that surrounds us and keeps us safe. One sign that we have received the Holy Spirit is the presence of the fruit of the Spirit. As Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. When we have the Holy Spirit, we bear fruit that reflects God's character, and that's what sets us apart from the world. Being a child of God comes with responsibilities. As we read in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the characteristics that should be evident in our lives when we allow God to work in our hearts. It's a lifelong journey, and it takes time for the fruit to manifest fully in our lives. Sometimes we might find ourselves struggling to display these characteristics in our daily lives, but we can always turn to God in prayer and ask Him for help. The key is to be patient with ourselves as we grow in the fruit of the Spirit. Remember, Growth takes time, but it is worth it. So, how do we know if we are growing in the fruit of the Spirit? Well, 
We can go through each of them and ask ourselves if we are manifesting them in our lives. But sometimes we might not sense God's presence. And that's when we need to examine ourselves and see if there's anything blocking the communication between us and God. David knew this all too well. In Psalm 32, he says that his bones were wasted away because of unconfessed sin in his life. And he only found relief when he acknowledged his sin and confessed it to God. We too can find relief when we confess our sins to God and ask Him to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, if you're feeling distant from God, don't despair. Confess your sins to Him and ask for forgiveness. Remember, the Bible tells us that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How do we get the presence of God? Through prayer and worship. When we worship, we're recognizing God's greatness and His presence in our lives. And when there's a constant progression of worship, the presence is felt even stronger. Worship creates an atmosphere where the presence of God is manifested. But it's not just about worshiping on Sundays. It's about being conscious of God within us at every moment, being aware of Him as if He was right in front of us. Remember, the Holy Spirit dwells in us, and we can build an atmosphere of God's presence through declarations, words, prayer, and worship. Each person that has a lifestyle of prayer and worship will always be a carrier of the presence of God. But when we carry God's presence, we naturally start to avoid unholy places and activities. We realize that we can't engage in unholiness and still expect to carry the personal presence of God with us. As Peter reminds us, we are called to be holy because God is holy. We need to conduct ourselves in a way that honors God, even in the little things. Carrying God's presence within us is a privilege and a responsibility. Let us embrace it fully and seek to live a life that honors God in all that we do. Have you ever felt like God is far away, like He's not there for you? It's okay to feel that way sometimes, but let me remind you, our faith shouldn't be based on our feelings. The Bible says that the righteous shall live by faith, Romans 1.17, and that without faith it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11.6 So even if we don't feel God's presence, we can trust that He's with us. But there may be times when we struggle to feel God's presence because of the challenges we're facing. Maybe it's unanswered prayers, disappointments, illnesses, or betrayal. However, if you're a true believer of Christ, you carry God's presence with you. You can't hide it, and others see it too. Your life should be evidence of God's presence, and others should see a visible transformation in you after you become born again. In the Bible, we see that Moses' face radiated with God's glory after he spent time in his presence. The Israelites couldn't even look at him because of the brightness. But we have an even greater privilege than Moses did. We have access to God's presence through Jesus and we can experience His glory in our lives. Sometimes, though, we may feel like God is far away because of sin in our lives. David, the psalmist, experienced this and said, When I kept silent about his sin, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Psalm 32, 3-5, emphasis added. Confession and repentance open the way for us to experience God's presence again. When we carry God's presence within us, we become dependent on Jesus alone for our salvation. We can't save ourselves, but we trust in Him to save us. Let us strive to be true carriers of God's presence, 
so that others may see His glory in our lives. In the Bible, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Wow, can you feel the power of those words? They are so important because they remind us that Jesus is the only way to salvation. No matter what false prophets or teachers may say, we don't need anything else besides Jesus to be saved. It's all about Him. But here's the thing, friends. When we truly accept Jesus into our hearts, we start to see changes in our lives. We start to bear fruit that shows that we are truly living for Him. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the things that we should see in our lives when we grow closer to God. And the beautiful thing is that as we spend more time with God, we become more like Him. We start to see His love and His peace shining through us. And that's how we know that we have truly received the Holy Spirit. It's not about performing miracles or preaching to millions of people. It's about bearing fruit and showing the world that we are truly living for Jesus. But sometimes we can feel like God isn't around. Maybe we haven't talked to Him in a while, or we've been avoiding Him. But friends, the amazing thing is that God is always with us. He is always ready to listen to us and guide us. All we have to do is confess what's on our hearts and ask Him to give us an ear to hear His voice again. So today, let's remember that Jesus is the only way to salvation. And as we grow closer to Him, we will see His fruit in our lives. Let's spend time with God every day and let Him transform us into His image. As we grow in our walk with God, we may find ourselves struggling with joy, kindness, and other aspects of our character that do not reflect God's nature. But fear not. We can always pray and ask God to help us in these areas. The Holy Spirit works in our lives to transform us from our old selves, the ones who were once enslaved to sin. <clears throat> Through this transformation, we can now possess the fruits of the Spirit and reflect God's character. It's important to remember that carrying God's presence means avoiding unholy places because God is holy and we cannot engage in unholiness and still expect to carry His presence with us. <clears throat> in 1 Peter 1, 14-16, we are reminded to be holy in all of our conduct, just as God is holy. We are ordinary Christians, but filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit, we can make all the difference in the world. The Holy Spirit transforms our hearts and helps us live righteous lives that please God. We cannot do it on our own, but with God's help, all things are possible. When we are transformed by the Holy Spirit, we become new creations and our behavior changes to reflect this transformation. The world believes in self-improvement, but the Holy Spirit takes us a step further by turning us into completely new beings. When others see this change in us, it can be a powerful witness of the transformational power of God. We must also remember that the promises of God apply to all of us in the family of God, not just to ourselves. We must walk with love and humility, knowing that we are all chosen and loved by God. As we continue to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, we will continue to carry God's presence with us. Remember, brothers and sisters, the greatest expression of God to humanity is love. Let us carry His presence with us always, and let His love shine through us to a world in need. Do you ever find yourself struggling to love those around you? Maybe it's your family, your neighbors, or even your fellow Christians from different denominations. It's not always easy to show love to others, but as Christians, 
it's so important that we do. I know firsthand how easy it can be for Christians to feud with each other over trivial things, and it breaks my heart to see. It's important that we come together in love and unity, remembering that we all serve the same God. We should never let our differences get in the way of our love for one another, and we should never twist the Word of God to suit our own agendas and spread hate. Speaking of the Word of God, did you know that carrying God's presence in your life can bring forth an incredible joy that transcends all the troubles and challenges of this world? It's true. But it also means that we will face spiritual warfare in our lives. If we're not experiencing any spiritual warfare, it may be because we're not carrying the presence of God and advancing His kingdom. But if we are, we need to be watchful against the enemy and actively resist any attacks that come against us. Now, let's talk about what it means to be anointed. An anointed person has a deep hunger for God's Word and a desire to know Him more. They soak in God's presence through worship and have a powerful sense of God's call on their lives. They know that they are a missionary called to lead people to Christ in a particular mission field. Christians, we have all been entrusted with unique gifts that we can use to serve God and edify the church. It's important to know what your gifts are so you can use them to their fullest potential. One gift that all anointed Christians have is discernment. This is the ability to sense the truth and distinguish between right and wrong. It's like having a still small voice within you that warns you of danger and helps you find the right words to encourage someone. Peace is also a distinguishing factor for Christians. In a world full of fear and instability, we can rely on the peace of God to guide us. We don't have to be afraid of economic instability or political unrest because we trust in God's sovereignty. Humility is another important trait for anointed Christians. It's important to recognize that we are not perfect and that we need correction and rebuke from other believers. We should be willing to repent from our sins and change for God's glory. Anointed Christians are also teachable. They are open-minded and willing to learn from others, even if they have been walking with God for many years. It's important to remain teachable so that we can continue to grow in our faith and knowledge of God. Lastly, patience is key when ministering to others. We will be dealing with imperfect people who need guidance and support. It's important to be patient and long-suffering, just as God is patient with us. Remember, when you carry the presence of God, you can walk through the fire without being burned. God's presence will not lead you away from danger, but it will lead you through it unscathed. As 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So go out and use your spiritual gifts to minister to others. Trust in God's presence and let Him guide you as you serve His people. So let's love one another, carry God's presence in our lives, and be anointed for the work God has called us to do. As it says in Psalm 133, 1, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. What if I told you that no matter what you are going through right now, God has a plan to turn your story around for good? What if I told you that He can take your pain and turn it into purpose, your mess and turn it into a message, your test and turn it into a testimony? What if you knew that God could use your brokenness and turn it into blessings, your weakness and turn it into strength, your failure and turn it into success. It sounds too good to be true, right? Well, in this video, we will show you how God can do all of that and more. 
we will share some amazing stories of people who experienced God's transforming power in their lives. We will also reveal some biblical principles and promises that will help you to trust God and cooperate with Him in the process of change. By the end of this video, you will be inspired and encouraged to believe and see God turn your own story around for good. The year was 701 BC, and the mighty Assyrian army was sweeping through the lands of Judah, capturing one fortified city after another. The king of Assyria, Sennacherib, had his eyes set on the prize, Jerusalem, the capital city and holy city of God's people. Isn't it intriguing how many nations and peoples have been keen on taking over Jerusalem? It seems that the so-called small city isn't really as small as everyone tries to make us believe it is. It's simple. The devil knows that this is God's prized land, and Jerusalem is the heart of it all. So no matter how many times the enemy tries and how many forces he'll gather, they will never prevail against God's people or his holy city. But back to our story. So Sennacherib sent his chief commander along with a large force to intimidate and threaten King Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem. The commander stood outside the city wall and shouted in Hebrew, mocking and taunting Hezekiah and his God. He said that no God of any nation could save them from the Assyrian power and that they should surrender and accept the terms of Sennacherib. He even went so far as to say that they would face a terrible siege and famine, resulting in eating their own dung and drinking their own urine. He accused Hezekiah of deception, claiming that the Lord would not deliver them. The people of Jerusalem, though terrified by these threats, obeyed Hezekiah's command to remain silent and report to him what they had heard. In response, Hezekiah tore his clothes and put on sackcloth, a sign of mourning and repentance. He went to the temple of the Lord and sent officials to Isaiah the prophet, asking him to pray for them and seek a message from the Lord. Isaiah's message brought assurance, saying that the Lord had heard the blasphemy of the Assyrian commander. The Lord promised to put a spirit in Sennacherib that would force him to return to his own land, where he would meet his demise. A short while later, Sennacherib received news of the Ethiopian king's approach and decided to withdraw from Jerusalem for a time. Still, he couldn't resist sending a letter to Hezekiah, repeating his threats and insults. He warned of his return to destroy Jerusalem, stating that Hezekiah should not trust in the Lord or Isaiah's words. Hezekiah took the letter to the temple of the Lord, spreading it before him and praying earnestly for salvation from Sennacherib. He acknowledged that Sennacherib had defied not only him, but also the living God, the only one capable of delivering them. Then Hezekiah implored God to display his glory and power by saving Jerusalem for his own sake and for the sake of his people. The Lord answered Hezekiah's prayer through Isaiah the prophet, proclaiming that Sennacherib had mocked and reproached him, but would not succeed. The Lord declared that he would defend Jerusalem for his own sake and for the sake of David, his servant. He promised to send an angel to destroy the Assyrian army in a single night and that Sennacherib would return to his land, only to be killed by his own sons. That very night, the angel of the Lord struck down 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When Sennacherib awoke to the gruesome sight the next morning, he broke camp and fled back to Nineveh, his capital city. There, as he worshipped in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons assassinated him. They escaped to the land of Ararat, while another son became king in his place. The Lord's promise through Isaiah had been fulfilled, saving Jerusalem from Sennacherib's hand. God demonstrated his faithfulness, power, sovereignty, and righteousness over all nations and their gods. They could not stand before him or resist his will. This story is found in Isaiah 36 through 37. It's a story of how God turned a helpless situation around for his people. You could come across this story while reading your Bible and then just continue on. However, there is something God wants you to see here and lead you down a new path in life where you too can see God turn your own story around for good. Let us start with the fact that challenges often come in life, not necessarily as a result of any offense towards anyone or as repercussion for something you did. 
Some challenges will come your way just simply because you exist and for who you are. We saw in the case of Judah and the Assyrian king that they never did anything to him to stir him up like this. Nonetheless, he still showed up, conquering their territories town by town set on conquering Jerusalem. Similarly, you may have wondered why certain attacks have happened in your life. Why did that relationship end? Why did that person have to hurt me? Why is my life so different and why do I put so much in and get so little out of life? Why are things not working for me and why is it taking so long for my own testimony to come? I can't tell you why everything in your life is the way it is. You may be where you are now, not because you sinned or because you offended anyone, but because of the wickedness of the enemy. The Bible tells us that the devil is always out and about, seeking whom to devour. And who are his targets? God's children. By simply being a child of God who has made up your mind to follow Jesus, you make yourself an automatic target of Satan's attacks. But also, your current situation might just be a part of the story leading to the testimony of your own breakthrough. One day, Jesus and his disciples saw a blind man. And his disciples asked Jesus if the man was blind because of his parents' sins or his own sins. And Jesus replied by saying that this man's situation had nothing to do with either his sins or his parents. Rather, this situation was one God was going to use for his glory. In other words, Satan was having a field day in this person's life. But God had a plan to use that for his glory. And guess what happened? Jesus healed the man completely that day. That man probably left his home that day, thinking it would be another day to be blind and beg for alms for people. Little did he know that God had marked that day for his change of story. And when he met Jesus, his story was changed for good. Think about the brightness of light from a light bulb. You may never really appreciate that light in the daytime when everywhere is bright. However, when the night comes, you need another light. The darker the night, the brighter the light bulb is. Similarly, I want you to believe that no matter what may be behind what you are going through today, God can and will use it to demonstrate His glory in your life. King Hezekiah from our story probably never knew how God was going to change the story, but he was confident that God would do it. His confidence was so strong that even the enemy noticed it. The enemy knew he couldn't break the king's confidence, so instead he tried to turn the heart of the people from the king by telling them that their king was deceiving them. Isn't this how the devil tries to deceive us? He mounts pressures on us by showing us how successful those who turn from God are. He shows us how wonderful it would be to choose other alternatives besides God. But if anyone gives in to Satan's offers, they are selling themselves and surrendering themselves into slavery. But thank God for King Hezekiah. He told the people not to answer the enemy. And after the enemy finished threatening them, they turned to God. Beloved, who do you turn to in the day of your adversity? You cannot expect God to turn your story around if God isn't the one you surrender that story to. Some people take their problems to other people and expect God to change the situation for good. However, the truth is that only those who surrender their story to God get to see God in action. Psalm 55:22 says, Cast your cares on the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Who will God sustain? Those who cast their cares on Him. Casting your cares means you surrender that story to God and you trust His process. You take your hands off the wheels and you let Him drive. You stop fighting and you let God take the field. You start rejoicing on your way to your breakthrough like you already have it. This, my friend, is how you see God turn things around. And this was what Hezekiah and the people of Judah did. They turned to the Lord, showed him the enemy's threats, and waited for God's answers. And because they stepped back for God to take over, they saw a miracle like they'd never witnessed before. In one night, God cleared out 185,000 enemies for his children's sake. 
It's time to step back, my friend. Time to let your faith in God speak. Pray about that situation. Get God's promise about it and hang on to it in faith. Then walk in that faith, speaking and acting accordingly. Then watch God turn your entire life around. It may take some time, but God never fails. You are about to come into a better season of your life. Don't let the devil question your confidence in God. Don't let him discourage you because it's taking so much time. God is never late and he never fails. In a world filled with choices and crossroads, it is often difficult to discern the right path to take. In this chaos, God beckons, urging you to walk the path of faith, not the unpredictable terrain of your emotions. Emotions like shifting sands can crumble beneath your feet, leading to decisions that waver with the changing winds. But faith is a solid rock, an unshakable foundation that promises miracles to those who dare to trust. In this video, God will be opening your eyes to see why and how you should walk by faith, unlocking a new door of greater experiences in your life journey. Stay with us to the end to receive all that God has for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, For we live by faith, not by sight. Beloved, imagine a journey where every step is carefully guided by God's divine power, ensuring that you are on the path that leads to the best possible outcomes. In the realm of daily life-altering decisions, the Lord God Almighty calls us to walk by faith, not by the fleeting emotions. Consider those choices before you, before saying yes to that relationship, moving to that new city, embracing that new job. Pause, reflect, and ask yourself, is this decision from the circumstances I see, or is it aligned with the divine whispers of God's guidance? Faith and emotions are not the same. The Word of God in 2 Corinthians makes it clear. Now, what sets your emotions apart from your faith in God? Emotions are the fleeting echoes of your mood, vulnerable to change with every breeze of opinion or revelation. Relying on them for crucial decisions is like building a castle on shifting sands. It won't last long, but faith, your connection with the Lord, transcends the limitations of mere feelings. It's an unbreakable bond with an unlimited God, ensuring that your choices are not bound by the constraints of the visible, but are guided by the hand of the unseen. It is like building on a rock. You can rest, knowing that you are safe. Emotions are a part of our human nature, and while they can be a beautiful aspect of our lives, they can also be influenced by our sinful desires. This is why it's crucial for us to be aware of how our emotions can impact our spiritual journey. For example, let's consider the emotion of lust. When we allow ourselves to be driven solely by our emotions, we may engage in sexual relationships outside the boundaries that God has set for us. This is known as fornication, and it goes against God's plan for purity and faithfulness within marriage. By succumbing to our emotions without considering God's principles, we open ourselves up to sin and its negative consequences. Remember, David and Bathsheba. His emotions took control, and the result was a series of unfortunate events with a hefty price tag. Another example is the emotion of greed. When we are driven by the desire for material possessions or financial gain, we may be tempted to steal or engage in dishonest practices. This not only goes against God's commandments, but also harms others and disrupts the harmony that God intends for society. By prioritizing our own desires over God's principles, we allow sin to enter our lives. In the Bible, there are numerous examples, warnings, and scenarios that highlight the importance of guarding our hearts and being cautious about the influence of our emotions. One such example is found in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, which says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. This verse reminds us to be mindful of our emotions and to filter them through the lens of God's Word. Additionally, the Apostle Paul warns us in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16-17, through 17, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. 
for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. This passage emphasizes the need to rely on the guidance of the Holy Spirit rather than being driven solely by our emotions. Ultimately, as Christians, we are called to surrender our emotions and desires to God, seeking His wisdom and guidance in every aspect of our lives. By aligning our emotions with God's principles and relying on His Spirit, we can navigate the complexities of our emotions in a way that honors Him and helps us grow spiritually. In the Bible, there are numerous examples of individuals who demonstrated unwavering faith in God. One such example was Noah building the ark when there wasn't a rain cloud in sight. Now, that's what you call a serious faith project. Despite facing ridicule and skepticism from others, Noah trusted God and faithfully obeyed his instructions. The story teaches us the importance of walking by faith, even when it seems impractical or contradictory to our current circumstances. Then there's Abraham, another inspiring example. God instructed Abraham to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice. Now, in our world, that's a big no-no, right? But Abraham, he was on board. Why? Because walking by faith means trusting God even when He seems like it's pulling you in the opposite direction. This account shows us the depth of Abraham's faith and his willingness to trust God completely, even in the most difficult and heartbreaking situations. Abraham's faith in God's promises was so strong that he believed God would provide an alternative, and God indeed intervened at the last moment and provided a ram for the sacrifice. Friends, living by faith is not limited to extraordinary circumstances or biblical figures. It is something we can incorporate into our daily lives as well. Have you ever wondered how to infuse your Tuesday with the same kind of faith Noah had while hammering away at that ark? Well, it's not about growing a beard and gathering two of every animal. It's about trusting God in the nitty-gritty of life. So, when you're deciding whether to say, I do or I don't, act by faith. Are money problems stressing you out? Trust God to be your provider and financial planner. After all, He's got a pretty good track record. Faith involves acknowledging that all we have comes from Him and being good stewards of the resources He has entrusted to us. This includes faithfully giving back to Him through tithes and offerings, as well as seeking His guidance in financial decisions. By trusting in God's provision, we can experience His faithfulness and blessings in our lives. Here's the secret, my friend. Living by faith isn't just a Sunday thing. It's a Monday morning, Wednesday afternoon, and Friday night thing, too. It's about weaving faith into the fabric of your everyday decisions, big or small. So, whether you're in your ark-building phase or facing your own, offer up your Isaac moment. Remember, faith isn't just a stroll in the park. Sometimes, it's a wild, unpredictable adventure. What's the best part? You're not in it alone. Hallelujah! As believers, we all face tests of faith throughout our lives. These tests can come in various forms, challenging our trust in God and His promises. It's like a universal series of tests we signed up for when we said yes to following Christ. And what is the key to passing these tests? Consistency. It's important to remember the significance of consistency in our faith to pass these tests. In James chapter 1, verse 12, we are reminded of the blessings that awaits those who persevere under trial. It says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Take Abraham, for instance. He was asked to sacrifice his own son Isaac. Talk about a faith test that could make or break you. But Abraham didn't just pass, he aced it with flying colors. You see, friends, such faith that endures through challenging circumstances is deeply pleasing to God. It's during these times that our faith is refined and strengthened, preparing us for even greater blessings and deeper intimacy with our Heavenly Father. Now, to maintain that strong relationship with God during difficult times, it's crucial to prioritize prayer. 
Prayer is not just a means to ask for help, but also a way to find comfort, peace, and strength in God's presence. As Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7 tells us, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Additionally, surrounding ourselves with fellow believers is vital. Having a supportive Christian community can provide encouragement, accountability, and a sense of belonging. When we face trials, we can lean on one another, pray together, and uplift each other in faith. In times of doubt or discouragement, immersing ourselves in Scripture brings encouragement and reminds us of God's faithfulness throughout history. His Word is a source of hope, guidance, and comfort that can sustain us through the most challenging seasons of life. Beloved, it's crucial to remember that the struggles we face on earth are temporary. As Christians, we have the assurance that our true home is in heaven, where there will be no more pain, sorrow, or trials. Earthly prosperity, though enticing, is fleeting and cannot compare to the eternal joy and reward we will experience in Christ. By keeping our focus on the eternal promises of God, we can find solace and strength to endure whatever tests of faith come our way. Romans chapter 8, verse 18 assures us, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So, when life decides to test your faith, remember, you're not just enduring, you're earning something way bigger than what this world can offer. That's the Christian confidence, knowing the best is yet to come, and it's worth the wait. But there is one more thing God wants you to do as you take your stand with faith and not emotions. Have dedication, a wholehearted commitment to God that goes beyond just lip service. As Christians, it's essential to fully dedicate ourselves to the Lord. It goes beyond just saying a few prayers or reading our Bibles occasionally. True dedication means accepting Jesus' sacrifice for our sins and allowing His love and grace to transform our lives. It means centering our lives on faith in God and committing ourselves wholeheartedly to follow His teachings. Remember when Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So, in walking by faith, we must commit to growing in that faith through dedication to God. We must remember that our dedication to God is not a one-sided commitment. God has given us everything through His Son, Jesus Christ. In return, He desires our full devotion and commitment. It's a reciprocal relationship built on love and trust. When we fully surrender our lives to Him, we can experience the depth of His love and blessings. In times of difficulty and trials, we can find strength knowing that God is working in and through us, molding us into the people He created us to be. Our endurance and trust in Him during tough times will result in an everlasting reward. Dedicating our lives to God means aligning our thoughts, actions, and desires with His will. It means seeking His guidance in decisions and allowing the Holy Spirit to transform us from within. It's a lifelong journey. As we continuously grow in our relationship with Him and deepen our understanding of His Word. Remember, beloved, God's desire for our dedication is rooted in His love for us. He knows what is best for us and wants to lead us into a life of purpose, fulfillment, and eternal joy. By wholeheartedly dedicating ourselves to Him, we open ourselves up to experience His abundant grace, mercy, and blessings. So, the next time you're praying or flipping through those Bible pages, ask yourself, am I all in? Because dedication to God isn't a part-time gig. It's a full-time commitment that transforms the ordinary into the extraordinary. Trust me, the journey with God is one you don't want to miss out on. This is what God is beckoning us to step into, a life of faith and complete devotion. Your emotions may fail, but know this, with God, victory is assured. No matter what challenges or obstacles we face, 
We can have confidence in His power and His plan for our lives. The enemy may try to scheme and deceive us, but God's purposes are greater and His goodness prevails. Let us trust in God's timing and His ways, even when they are different from our own expectations. His plans for us are always better than anything we could ever imagine. He sees the bigger picture and knows what is truly best for us. So, we can surrender our desires and submit to His guidance, knowing that He has our best interests at heart. May we continue to walk by faith, anchored in the truth of God's Word, and filled with anticipation for the incredible things He has in store for us. If this video blessed you, please give it a like and subscribe to our channel for more blessed content. I want you to know that you're not here by chance. The Holy Spirit has guided you to this very moment because He has a message for you. That message is simple yet powerful. You can trust Him. Please know that this comes straight from my heart to yours. I understand that life can be overwhelming with its ups and downs, financial struggles, unfulfilled dreams, and the weight of your goals taking longer than expected. But let me assure you, as someone who's personally witnessed God's faithfulness, you can trust Him. He never fails, and He will never let you down if you place your trust in Him. In Isaiah 57:13, the latter part of the verse says, But whoever takes refuge in me will inherit the land and possess my holy mountain. There's something truly remarkable about finding refuge in the Lord and putting our trust in Him. Allow me to share a recent testimony with you. I believe that there's someone out there who needs to hear about God's faithfulness to reignite their faith and to stand strong once again. My hope and pray that that person is you, my dear friend. There is a prayer for you at the end of this message. I want you to watch until the end so you can claim the blessings in that prayer. It'll bring healing, hope, and grace to your life. May God bless you in Jesus' name. Now, let me share an incredible story that happened to me. About a year ago, during an annual program at my church fellowship, they asked everyone to write down their heart's desires. They believed that we would come back with testimonies the following year. I wrote down my request, even though I was feeling lost and had almost given up hope. But deep inside, I still clung to faith, believing that God would come to my aid. Now, fast forward a few weeks ago when I was praying about a current project I was working on. The Holy Spirit directed my heart to a note from that meeting last year. As I flipped through the pages, I couldn't believe my eyes. The project I was working on, the very thing I was trusting God to help me complete, was the answer to that prayer from last year. It was mind-blowing and humbling at the same time. But little did I know that the miracle had only just begun. As the project progressed, I found myself in need of a new home before a deadline. If I didn't meet that deadline, it would have been quite embarrassing for me. I was at my breaking point, and once again, I turned to the Lord for help. I received a message to come check out a small apartment that fit my budget. Even though I wasn't thrilled about the size or location, I was willing to settle for it just to save face. But when I saw the place, something unexpected happened. The agent in charge of the property told me he had something bigger and better at a cheaper price. I was taken aback because it wasn't something I was expecting from him. After all, property agents often prioritize their commissions. So referring me to a bigger property where he would make less money didn't make sense. But he told me he could see God's grace upon me and was certain that I was in the place God wanted me to be. I still couldn't wrap my mind around it because the property was not only bigger than I had expected, but also more than I needed where I currently am in life. It felt like getting a property meant for a large family. But then I thought, what if this was God's plan for me? Who was I to say no? So I went to check out the property, and the moment I laid eyes on it, I felt an overwhelming sense of peace and joy. I knew deep down that this was God's gift to me. And here's the amazing part. I was given the property on my own terms. I could pay on my own terms and move in on my own terms. It was as if the property had been specifically reserved for me. 
friends, this experience taught me something profound. It reminded me that God's plans for us are often bigger and better than we can imagine. Sometimes we may feel undeserving or unsure, but if we trust in Him, He'll lead us to the right path and provide beyond our expectations. So, my encouragement to you is to keep trusting God, even when things seem impossible or when you feel like giving up. He is faithful and His ways are higher than ours. You never know what miracles await you just around the corner. When I returned home, I was still completely awestruck trying to make sense of everything that just occurred. And in that moment, a verse from the book of Ephesians came rushing to my mind. It's Ephesians 3.20 and it says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. I couldn't help but realize that the blessing I'd received was beyond anything I could have asked for or even imagined. God had gone above and beyond what I had anticipated. That's why I can confidently say that you didn't stumble upon this video by mistake. The Holy Spirit is sending you this message to remind you to hold on, to not let go of your faith. I always say, if you have strength for one more step, take it. It's a reminder that even when we feel like we can't go any further, when we're at our lowest point, we need to keep moving forward. And that's exactly what I want to encourage you to do, my brother and sister. Don't look back, but press on. For there is so much waiting for you if you can dare to trust the Lord with the challenges you're facing right now. Let's take a moment to imagine what would have happened if the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, had given up and surrendered when they felt God wasn't coming through for them. You might remember their story in the book of Daniel. The king had ordered that a fiery furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual, and the boys were thrown into it because they refused to bow down to the king's golden image. Now think about this. Sometimes it's easier to trust God when there's no deadline, or when the deadline still seems far away. But what if the fires are close? What if the situation is pressing in on us? Can we still keep trusting Him? The Hebrew boys faced that very dilemma. They were faced with the scorching flames, and it seemed like there was no way out. But their faith remained unshaken. They trusted God even when they were thrown into the furnace. They believed that God was able to save them, but even if He didn't, they were resolved to remain faithful. In that moment of absolute trust, God showed up in an unprecedented way. As the boys stood in the middle of the blazing fire, they were joined by a fourth figure, one who resembled a son of the gods. God Himself came down to deliver them from harm. Imagine the awe and wonder that must have filled their hearts as they witnessed this miraculous intervention. Not a single hair on their heads was singed, and their clothes were untouched by the flames. God had not only saved them, but He also had displayed His power in a way that surpassed all expectations. So, dear friend, as we bring this story back to our current discussion, I want to remind you once again to keep holding on to your faith. Just as I experienced the blessing that exceeded my wildest dreams, I want you to know that God is able to do immeasurably more than you can ask or imagine. Trust Him with that issue you're facing, even if it feels like the odds are against you or if the situation seems impossible. Remember the three Hebrew boys and their unwavering trust. Trust God even when it seems like all hope is lost. Keep moving forward, my brother, my sister, for there is a future filled with blessings that await you. Don't let go of your faith and let God's power work within you to accomplish far more than you can ever imagine. Now I invite you to join me in this prayer of faith. Make sure that your heart is open to receive God's blessings. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today with grateful hearts, thanking you for your unwavering love and remembrance. Even when we feel forgotten, you never forsake us. Your faithfulness is beyond measure, and we are grateful for your constant presence in our lives. Father, we humbly ask for your forgiveness for the times when we've allowed challenges and crises to overwhelm us, causing us to lose faith in you. Help us to remember that even in the midst of difficulties, you are still working in the background. Grant us the grace to trust you wholeheartedly 
and to never give up on you. Lord, we pray for the restoration of our faith. Renew our spirits and fill us with your grace. Open our eyes to see what you're doing in the background, even when we cannot perceive it. Give us the faith to trust in you, knowing that your plans for us are far greater than we can imagine. We lift up everyone who is trusting you for a miracle. Lord, just as you showed up for me, I ask that you manifest your power in their lives as well. Perform unprecedented miracles, even in situations where all hope seems lost. Your word tells us of the story of Lazarus, who was dead for four days. But when the Lord Jesus showed up, he commanded the stone to be rolled away, showing that man's conclusion is not your conclusion. You raised Lazarus back to life to prove your dominion over death and the grave. Father, in this same faith, we ask that you bring forth miracles that defy human understanding. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke the spirit of fear and depression. Your word assures us that with joy, we will draw water from the wells of salvation. Therefore, Lord, we ask that you fill our hearts with your joy, which surpasses all understanding. May your joy be our strength, empowering us to overcome every obstacle that comes our way. Father, we present before you the specific needs of each individual. We pray for healing, deliverance, and divine intervention in our lives, our finances, our businesses, our careers, and our ministries. May your healing touch be upon those in need, and may your divine intervention restore what's been lost, whether it be relationships, opportunities, grace, or health. We declare our trust in your power to bring restoration and redemption to every aspect of our lives, Lord. I declare in faith that just as you showed consistency in keeping me and every member of our team and community going, you will consistently guide all of us and manifest your blessings in our lives. May our hearts overflow with gratitude for the miracles, both seen and unseen, that you're working on on our behalf. We offer this prayer in alignment with your promises, and we trust that you're able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to your power at work within us. Father, your promises are steadfast, and your grace is abundant. We rely on your unfailing love and guidance as we navigate through life, now and always. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Heaven is a place of God's endless display of His majestic glory and beauty. It is a home for everyone who believed in Jesus Christ during their lifetime. It is a place of perpetual warmth from God. It is a place where we will see Him as He is. What if I told you that no one that makes it to heaven will be without a home? Do you know that when we get to heaven, we will all be rewarded? Many people are not aware of the many promises God made about heaven. In fact, some people believe that heaven will be a very boring place, but nothing is farther from the truth. The Bible gives us several hints that heaven will be a very interesting place to be. Heaven is going to be full of inexplicable experiences. It will be full of surprises for all of eternity. In this video, I will be revealing through the lens of the Bible what God is preparing for you in heaven. So, stay with me as we jump in. As you watch this, I am praying that your faith and conviction to follow Christ will grow stronger as the days go by. There is an interesting idea Jesus said in John chapter 14 verses 1 through 3 about his plans for us when we get to heaven. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. How would it feel if you discover that heaven is a glorious display of God's beauty and excellence waiting for you to explore and enjoy? Yes. I can already feel the smile on your face. This is exactly how the disciples felt when Jesus was speaking to them. Immediately, they realized that Jesus was preparing a place for them, and their hearts must have been elated. Jesus' words in John 14 are the reality of everyone who believes in Jesus Christ, regardless of your status on earth, wealthy or poor, influential or not, 
educated or uneducated. Jesus assured that he went to prepare a place for all who follow him. This is an assurance to remain true to our belief in him until he returns. Though Jesus was going away from the disciples, he assured them that he was coming back after he finished preparing a place for them. This is a good reason why they should have not been troubled. They would have a glorious eternal future in heaven. With such promises, they should not have allowed the things of the world to weigh too heavily on them. In Mark chapter 10 verses 28 through 30, Peter asked a very important question about their reward as Jesus' followers. And Peter spoke up, We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children in fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Jesus assured the disciples that for everything they left to follow him, they would have in return a hundredfold. This includes houses, families, businesses, careers, and any other thing you can think of. Jesus promised that they will get all these things back a hundred times over. This is similar to his promise in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, that says all these things will be added to those who seek first the kingdom of God. While Jesus did not expressly speak about buildings here, he directly said that the believer's quality of life in heaven is everlasting. We will spend eternity in God's presence. We will forever live and enjoy the beauty that serenades from His presence. This is exactly what Jesus was telling the disciples to give them peace over the things that they had lost. In the parable of the talents, we see some interesting facts about the beauty of heaven. While the reward for the faithful servants was clear and great, the punishment for the unfaithful servant was devastating and should serve as a caution to us Matthew chapter 25 verse 30 says, And throw that worthless servant outside, into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The servant was cast out to a place where darkness reigned. This suggested that heaven will be full of light. The brilliance from God's throne will flood every nook and cranny of heaven. Every room will display the awesome creativity of the Creator. Let us consider Revelation chapter 21 verses 22 through 25 which talks about the light we will enjoy in God's holy city. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The rewards we gain in heaven are not like the rewards we earn here on earth. We tend to think in material terms. Consider how a child who wins a spelling bee treasures the trophy for what that trophy means. Likewise, any rewards or honor we gain in heaven will be precious to us because they carry the meaning of our relationship with God and because they remind us of what He did through us on earth. Similarly, rewards in heaven glorify God and provide us with joy peace, and wonder as we consider God's work in us and through us. The closer we are to God during this life, the more centered on Him and aware of Him, the more dependent on Him, and the more desperate for His mercy, the more there will be to celebrate. We are like characters in a story who suffer doubt, loss, and fear, wondering if we will ever really have our heart's deepest desires. When the long-awaited happy ending comes and our desires are fulfilled, there is a conclusion. The story would not be satisfying without that conclusion. Rewards in heaven are the conclusion of our earthly story, and those rewards will be eternally satisfying. The word translated house in John 14 literally means an abode, and figuratively means a family. This suggests that Jesus was saying that there will be many people in his family, all abiding together. Within God's heavenly house, Christians will live in the Lord's presence. Jesus Christ has prepared a place in heaven for His own, those who have come to Him in faith. The Holy Spirit prepares the redeemed on earth for their place in heaven. This shows how committed God is to bringing us into our heavenly reward with Him. In 1 Corinthians 3, verses 11 through 15, the Apostle Paul explains a fascinating idea about our reward. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. 
If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. This again confirms that there is heavenly reward laid up for every believer, and this reward is an eternal reward. It far exceeds anything that we can ever have here on earth. It exceeds the perishable riches of the world, the deceitful wealth that comes from worldly influence, and what human effort can ever achieve. As believers, we must be encouraged in the fact that there is an eternal reward for us, and that we will live in God's presence forever with other believers. We can trust that God is a perfect place prepared for each believer to dwell. Our focus should not be on whether there will be individual homes or the greatness of those homes, but on the Lord's presence and in living with other believers in perfect glory for eternity. This should be our greatest motivation and inspiration as we journey through this life. Consider 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 8-9. through 9. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. Since we are going to enter Christ's presence and be with Him forever, it should have a profound effect on the way we live. Paul confirmed that it affected his own way of life, whether alive or dead. He wanted to please Christ about everything else. Those who please Christ will not aim to please themselves. They will live for Christ's glory and the good of others. Those who do not wish to please Christ are not true to servants of God. When we go to be with the Lord, we will be at home with Him, and the years we will spend with Him will be full of so much joy. It is indeed going to be a home because the Lord's presence will be nothing short of a home for the believer. Revelation describes believers living together in heaven. There will be one heavenly city with believers from every people group, nation, and language worshiping the Lord together. Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. In conclusion, we must not allow life's pressures to push us out of the faith. Let us hold fast to the faith we profess and remain confident that He who has begun a good work in us will perform it even unto the day of Jesus Christ's return. Jesus has promised that He is preparing a place for us and all who believe. Let us not be distracted by deception. We must cast our gaze on the One who has called us into marvelous light. Finally, listen to what john the beloved said in revelation chapter 7 verses 15 through 17 and let this inspire your heart therefore they are before the throne of god and serve him day and night in his temple and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence never again will they hunger never again will they thirst the sun will not beat down on them nor any scorching heat for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd he will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes.